This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 234 of the program. Today is Friday, March 27th, and before we get started, as usual, I want to take some time to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which signed up for the very first time to support us this week, and that includes... Bertram Miller, Craig Webley, Crystal Rose, Dave Collins, Francis Grabenhofer, Gabby Lee, Idioma Onuoha, Ingar Holin, Linda Corey, Linda Geisler, Michael Rudge, M.R. Marmello, Nancy Hodgson, Rachel Bauer, and Sue Ann Zimmerman. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com forward slash humanistreport, or clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. So this week, we've got a great show for you all. We'll talk about Joe Biden's absence, as well as Donald Trump's inability to act like a grown-up during times of crisis. And we'll also talk about how Donald Trump may put everyone's life at risk, all to make sure that he protects big business. Bernie Sanders won the Democrats abroad primary and we'll discuss whether or not this is a sign of things to come and I'll make the case for him staying in the race in spite of calls for him to drop out. We'll talk about the lieutenant governor of Texas who thinks that old people's lives are less valuable than profits of big business. David Sirota demolishes Neera Tandon AOC tells us to brace ourselves in the midst of a global pandemic, and Biden is still struggling to appeal to young voters. I'll tell you what I think he can do to win them over. That and more will be discussed on today's episode. Hopefully, you all will enjoy the program. Let's go ahead and get right into it. Look, I'll admit for a second, Donald Trump and the Republican Party, they were doing a mildly good job. They were doing an adequate job at convincing people that maybe they cared a little bit about working Americans. Now, of course, this was nothing more than a ruse because it's not the Americans who they care about. What I said uh, was that, you know, capitalists, they acknowledge that we can't buy their goods and services if we have no money. So if we're going to be looking at another economic recession, possibly a Great Depression scenario, you have to take care of workers. Otherwise, the entire system itself can't survive. Capitalism implodes, right? But the problem here is that if we really want to take drastic action, flatten the curve, so to speak, We have to make sure that we are practicing social distancing, people are staying home, but the problem is this will lead to industries failing. The casino industry is asking for a bailout. The airline industry is asking for a bailout because people aren't traveling unless it's essential. So now what Republicans are doing is they're just taking the mask off. With Donald Trump, as of late, he's gone full mask off. He's revealing that when push comes to shove, he doesn't give a damn about the American people. He cares about the profits of large multinational corporations. Because look at what he tweeted out. In all caps, he says, we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. At the end of the 15-day period, we will make a decision as to which way we want to go. No, I mean, I don't think that during a global pandemic, these types of cryptic tweets are very helpful because you can't really tell what he means by this. So all we can do is speculate. But if he really means what we all think it means, this is horrific. Like, the implications of this are absolutely horrifying. Because what he chooses to do doesn't just impact America, it impacts the rest of the world. So if he says, you know what, I hear you about flattening the curb and, you know, all of this uh, social distancing, but we're going to send everyone back to work. We're going to make sure that the economy doesn't suffer and it's business as usual, if he does this, people are going to die. A lot of people are going to die. Now, it's already the case that COVID-19 is going to kill thousands, hundreds of thousands, potentially, of human beings. It's just a matter of what are we going to do to limit the death toll? That's really what we're faced with now. And 
Part of limiting the death toll, flattening the curve, means we have to take extreme measures. Will the economy and certain industries suffer? Yes, but that's something that we have to do if we truly care about human lives. But Trump is revealing here, actually, the economy is more important to me. Why? Because if the economy tanks, what's going to happen? Well, if you are an incumbent president and you're in an election year and the economy suffers, you usually lose. That's what history indicates anyways. So basically, if the economy suffers, then he may suffer. So this is about self-interest. That's if he truly is going to do this. Now, he gave us an indication that, uh, yeah, I care more about the economy than saving human lives. Because as Axios reports, Trump says coronavirus restrictions will be lifted soon, dismissing health experts. And he hinted at this during his latest press conference. And this is just, this is insane. And I will say we're going to be watching our senior citizens very closely. We're going to be watching uh, certain hotspots like New York. And within New York, you have areas which are troubling. And we'll be working with the governor and the mayor and everybody else on those spots. Uh, but at the same time, at a certain point, we have to get open and we have to be uh, we have to get moving. We don't want to lose these companies. We don't want to lose these workers. We want to take care of our workers. So we'll be doing something. Uh, I think relatively quickly, but we've learned a lot during this period. This was a very necessary period. Uh, tremendous information was gained, but we can do two things at one time. You know, and again, I say we have uh, a very active flu season, more active than most. It's looking like it's heading to 50,000 or more deaths, deaths, not cases, 50,000 deaths, uh, which is, uh, that's a lot. And uh, you look at uh, automobile accidents, which are far greater than any numbers we're talking about. That doesn't mean we're going to tell everybody no more driving of cars. So we, we have to do things uh, to get our country open. But this has been an incredible period of learning, and we'll have announcements over the next uh, fairly short period as to the timing. In other words, yeah, I get that social distancing is absolutely necessary if we want to flatten the curve. I hear you. But this is hurting the economy. Social distancing is hurting the economy. And if the economy suffers, that's going to hurt my re-election chances. So I hear what the CDC says. I hear what the World Health Organization says. I hear you. But I just don't care. Now, there are some estimates that say this could last until spring of 2021. And Donald Trump said at this press conference, quote, I'm not looking at months. I can tell you that right now. So let's say that we need social distancing for three months. He's telling you flat out, not going to happen. Not going to happen because profits, the economy, that matters more than the lives of human beings. And like this is, you would think it goes against his own self-interest because the people who are disproportionately impacted are elderly voters who by and large are propping up the Republican Party. So if you kill off your base, that's going to hurt you. But I mean, he's not thinking logically. He's just panicking and he's not a leader. He, you know, he's in over his head. He doesn't know what to do. He's not cut out for this. And it's to a point now where I think the CNN headline that uh, Ken Klippenstein shared is terrifyingly accurate. It describes the situation too well. Dollars versus deaths. How many lives is the world economy worth? That's what President Trump faces as coronavirus creates a self-inflicted economic shutdown. Just the mere fact that we have to have this debate and question whether or not our government values the economy over human lives and certain industries over human lives shows you how much of a failure capitalism is. It's already killing the planet itself, like Earth, is becoming uninhabitable because we value the profits of private companies over the habitability of our planet. And you're seeing firsthand how um, they don't even care if it kills people. If it kills off a large portion of the American population and the world population, meh. I'd rather just make sure that it's business as usual because I don't want the economy to suffer. Now, 
you have to, like, if you are a world leader from a different country, you have to be furious right now. Because if Donald Trump says, hey, everyone, it's business as usual, that's going to have implications for the world because the virus will spread here in the United States. And in turn, it will proliferate throughout the world. So, I mean, the fact that this is even something that we're considering, the fact that it's mask off and they're just saying the quiet part out loud now is absolutely insane. I mean, the lieutenant governor of Texas, Dan Patrick, admitted that he would rather risk his own survival to make sure that the economy continues on the current trajectory. Well, even if it's the case that he does send everyone back to work, it's business as usual, right? Not every single country will do that. There are still going to be economic ramifications that will negatively impact us if other countries follow precautions. So this is unnecessary. If he chooses unilaterally to, you know, discourage social distancing, people may die for nothing and we still may have a global recession. But again, he's desperate. He's not thinking rationally. He's not a very logical person. He's an emotional person. Hence why we see so many all caps tweets from him. Now, to be fair, it's not just Donald Trump, because Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York, one of the states that has been hit the hardest, if not the hardest, kind of hinted at the same thing. Because as Anthony Pascal of New York one tweeted, breaking Governor Cuomo, quote, we have to plan the pivot back to economic functionality, says we may not have to isolate everyone, could allow the healthy, less vulnerable to work. COVID-19 survival rate is 98%. New York forward plan to look into restarting economic engine. Cuomo, at some point you have to open the valve because this is not sustainable. Says he has no second thoughts about keeping all non-essential workers home despite damage to the economy. Says there will be political consequences, but claims he doesn't care. Cuomo, the first order of business is to deal with this health crisis. We are still in the relative calm before the storm. Once we get through a health crisis, we will plan for economy so it's subtle but what he's hinting at here is look i get the necessity of social distancing and yes you know we're on lockdown but what if we just let maybe some young people return to work who are healthy i mean this should tell you everything that you need to know about our economic system capitalism and what it has done to our leaders they literally care more about the economy than your life that should tell you something that should make you irate you're paying taxes into a system that doesn't value you it values our economic system and big business more than you that should make you feel completely uneasy with the capitalist status quo it should make everyone an anti-capitalist and i don't care what you are democratic socialist anarcho-syndicalist an anarchist so long as you're not a capitalist then i think that that's logical but if you're still a capitalist when this system is going full mask off and we can see it. I mean, it's already gone mask off, right? It's already done enough to reveal itself. But if you're still proudly capitalist, I don't know what to tell you. It, there's a reason why younger people disproportionately are more in favor of socialism than capitalism. Because look at what the system is doing. It values the economy and the profits of big business more than our lives. And that should make everyone incredibly angry. So, um, I don't really know what else to say. All that I will tell you is disregard what the government says if they're telling you to put your life at risk for the economy. If you work for a large multinational corporation like GameStop, they close now, but and they're telling you that you should risk your life just to make them profits, disregard what they say. The, like... At the end of the day, you have to acknowledge that your life is more important. And capitalism has basically made people buy into this notion that their lives don't really matter. They're, you know, just a cog in the machine and making sure that customers get video games or fucking, I don't know, something that doesn't really matter is more important than your own life. But that's not true. The economy can't survive without human beings. And because of that, we should be valuing human lives over everything else but i mean donald trump he just he genuinely doesn't care he's rich he's gonna be okay he's older but he has money so he will receive the best health care he's being constantly tested for covid19 
He's going to be okay at the end of the day. But the individuals who will suffer the most are the people who are vulnerable, who are at the bottom of our economic totem pole. And that should absolutely enrage everyone. But the fact that people are still complicit and have bought into this disgusting cult of an economic system, it tells you how effective it is and how much more vocal we're going to have to be in defeating it. So I want to pose a hypothetical question to you, the viewer. If given the choice between letting hundreds of thousands, if not millions of old people die, or letting the economy stagnate, potentially suffer for a little bit, which would you choose? I mean, to me, that's a really easy choice. Of course, we're saving lives. Human lives are much more valuable than the economy because the economy and money, these are all social phenomena. We made these things up. So without human beings to partake in an economy, without human beings to be able to spend money, these things have no value. So human life is the most valuable thing. But given how coronavirus isn't just going to impact our health and safety, but it will also have some pretty huge ramifications with regard to the economy, if we really want to flatten the curve, so to speak, we have to take action. And yes, the economy will suffer. Well, Republicans are basically now saying the quiet part out loud, and they're admitting that they would rather let lots and lots of old people die rather than basically allowing some companies to lose profits not even kidding. So in an interview with Tucker Carlson on Fox News, Lieutenant Governor of Texas Dan Patrick said this, and um, I still can't believe it. Take a look. And you know, Tucker, no one reached out to me and said, uh, as a senior citizen, uh, are you willing to take a chance on your survival in exchange for keeping the America that all America loves for your children and grandchildren? And if that's the exchange, I'm all in. Um, and that doesn't make me noble or brave or anything like that. I just think there are lots of grandparents out there in this country, like me, I have six grandchildren, that what we all care about and what we love more than anything are those children. And I want to you know, live smart and, uh, and, and see through this, but I don't want the whole country to be sacrificed uh, and, I, and that's what I see. I've talked to hundreds of people, Tucker, and just in the last week, and uh, making calls all the time. And, and everyone says pretty much the same thing, that we can't lose our whole country. We, we're having an economic collapse. I'm also a small businessman. I understand it. And I talk with business people all the time, Tucker. And, and I'm so, my, I'm just, my heart is lifted tonight by what I heard the president say, because we can do more than you know, one thing at a time. We can do two things. So, you know, my message is that um, let's get back to work. Let's get back to living. Let's be smart about it. Uh, and those of us who are 70 plus, we'll, we'll take care of ourselves, but don't sacrifice the country. Don't do that. Don't ruin so this great American So you're basically dream. saying that this disease could take your life, but that's not the scariest thing to you. There's something that would be worse than dying. Yeah. I can't believe he said that, and I have seen this clip multiple times in preparation for this segment, and I am still speechless. We all knew that capitalism was a cult, but the way that they're kind of explicitly admitting that this is one of those crazy suicidal cults, it's just, it's remarkable. Wow. And he said, look, I don't want to seem noble or brave by admitting that, you know, I'd rather die then let the economy tank a little bit. Um, first of all, it's not people like Dan Patrick who will die. It's the vulnerable people, the elderly people who have not much money to their name, the elderly people who are struggling to get by and uh, get groceries for themselves. That's the people who this is going to disproportionately impact. Because it's never the rich, it's never the elite class or the powerful, it's always the most vulnerable. Those at the tippy top will be fine, but it's your grandma, it's my grandma, it's the people who are already struggling, they're the ones who will be affected by this. And he says, look, given the choice between taking a chance on my survival 
or having us be the same America for my children and grandchildren, I'm gonna opt for, you know, keeping things as is. I'd rather die than uh, have these CEOs of large multinational corporations take a little bit of a hit. I mean, this logic is absolutely insane. And anyone who is a capitalist after we make it through this pandemic needs to wake the fuck up. Because this is really showing just how cruel and ruthless our economic system is, where we are literally valuing a made-up economic system that we created over our own well-being and health. Is that not maddening? What are we doing? Yes, the economy will likely suffer if we truly do practice very disciplined social distancing for a while, but there are things that you can do Policies you can enact to ameliorate that, right? You can make sure that workers have enough money because if we don't have money, then we can't stimulate the economy. The economy kind of needs us to have a little bit of purchasing power if you want it to function properly. But I mean, there are steps that you can take. Now, we saw Republicans float ways to help Americans. And I made a video last week where they were kind of sounding like Bernie Sanders. Tom Cotton kind of sounded a little bit like Bernie Sanders because during a pandemic, Everyone sounds like a socialist because that's the only thing that works. You can't let the free market do its thing during a global pandemic. You need to directly put money in the hands of workers and not these large multinational corporations. Because if you bail out the airline and casino industries, but people don't have money to put it back into the economy to spend money at these casinos or airline industries, what's the point of it? If you want capitalism to function, people have to have money to stimulate the economy. Now, I thought that capitalists realized that, but um, apparently they don't. And this is really showing that people in this country, our leaders, capitalists, they literally are willing to not just let people die in order to avoid any type of economic ramifications that may you know, come to fruition with this virus. They're admitting it. They're telling you how... Your life is not valuable. If you are a Republican voter and you're old, I mean, they're telling you, they're admitting now that your life doesn't mean anything to them. The GOP is willing to kill off their own voting base just to make sure that their corporate donors don't lose any profits. How can you continue voting for this party? This party is psychopathic. This is a death cult. That's what this is. This is a psychopathic death cult. How can you continue to support them? Is xenophobia and racism really that important? Because they're telling you, I don't care if you die. The dude wants old people to die just to make sure the economy doesn't suffer at all. And Trump has the same line of thinking now. I'm just kind of taken aback by this because it's not like this is surprising to me. It's just what's surprising, I think, is the fact that they're admitting this. Like, I never expected them to just openly admit, of course we value, you know, profit over the lives of people, I never thought that they would admit this. But here we are. And yet, there's still going to be millions of people in this country who proudly identify as capitalist when they see exactly what the system does and what it's doing during a time of crisis. Like, everyone should abandon capitalism. Nobody should be a capitalist after COVID-19. And you already shouldn't have been a capitalist if you've been working nine to five and can barely pay the bills. But nonetheless, I mean, everything is laid out to bear here. You see it. You see it firsthand what's more valuable. It's not your life. It's profits. So after 9-11, George W. Bush had the highest approval rating of any president ever in Gallup's history with a 90% approval rating. And even though we all know now that he ended up being one of the most incompetent and destructive presidents in American history, he at least was cognizant of the fact that during times of crisis, Americans seek one thing, and that is a leader. And the bar is really, really low. Like, you don't even have to be that good at it. You just have to be present be visible, make lots of speeches, give us nice platitudes, assure us that everything is going to be okay, don't shit your pants on national television, and that's it. You'll get a higher approval rating. And even though Donald Trump has already botched his response to COVID-19, he's benefiting by just being 
present because a majority of Americans approved of his coronavirus response, which, I mean, is astonishing given that he has been very dismissive of the crisis. He, you know, downplayed its severity and only recently took it seriously. But this poll shows us that Americans just want a leader. So just the mere fact that he has these White House press briefings frequently, just the mere fact that he has a more calm demeanor, people are going to respond to that because Americans want a leader. That's what this poll says. That's what the Gallup, you know, approval rating for George W. Bush tells us. And, you know, for a little bit, he was doing okay. He was acting like an adult, kind of. But you can see that he's already starting to unravel because he's incapable of being a grown-up. He's incapable of being a leader. And I'll show you why that is. So he did a White House press briefing last week, and a reporter threw him the, uh, like, easiest softball question ever, just lobbed it right down the center, and he could have easily just hit it out of the park. But what does he do? Instead, he chooses to have a complete meltdown and throw a temper tantrum because you got offended by the reporter because he misunderstood the question that the reporter was asking. Take a look. Let's follow up. John, go ahead. Dead. What do you say the Americans were scared, though? I guess nearly 200 dead, 14,000 who were sick, millions, as you witnessed, who are scared right now. What do you say to Americans who are watching you right now who are scared? Uh, I say that you're a terrible reporter. That's what I say. I think it's a very nasty question, and I think it's a very bad signal that you're putting out to the American people. The American people are looking for answers, and they're looking for hope. And you're doing sensationalism, and uh, the same with NBC and Comcast. So I don't call it, I don't call it Comcast, hope. I call it Comcast. Let me just ask for whom you work. Let me just say something. That's really bad reporting. And you ought to get back to reporting instead of sensationalism. Let's see if it works. It might and it might not. I happen to feel good about it, but who knows? I've been right a lot. <laughs> like, I, I get angry when I think about it, but then I watch the clip again, and then I just, I can't, I can't not laugh. This was so easy. Mr. President, what do you say to Americans who are watching you, who are scared? Here's an answer. Just, I'm pulling this out of my ass. I tell them to rest assured that the American people, we have the spirit to persevere. We've made it through worse things before, and I guarantee you we'll make it through this stronger than we've ever been before. Like, say something like that. But what does he do? Um, I say you're a terrible reporter. Very nasty question. Terrible. What are you doing? That was a softball. He threw you a fucking softball. And you have a fucking conniption fit because you think that he is lobbing a personal attack towards you. No, dummy, he was giving you a softball, a question that shouldn't have been asked because it's such a softball, idiotic question. So I agree, it was, you know, he's probably a terrible reporter because he asked such a dumb softball question that's unnecessary. But I mean, maybe he just feels, look, maybe I should give Donald Trump the opportunity to be a leader here. And Donald Trump just fucking face planted. I mean, this is... This is the bare minimum that you have to do as president. Just be a fucking leader. Pretend. Lie. Like, just make it seem as if you know what you're doing and you have your shit together, but he can't help himself. The guy is a maniac. This dude is a fucking maniac. And if his handlers don't constantly cater to him, give him a juice box, set him in front of a TV with Fox News on, he's going to have temper tantrums. We're seeing that there. Now, on top of that, he uh, made a very, very alarming tweet. In all caps, he says, We cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. At the end of the 15-day period, we will make a decision as to which way we want to go. Now, I address the meaning of that. I try to decode it because it's very cryptic in a different video. So I'm not going to dive into the substance here. Not that there was much, but just... In general, the overall tone, and I don't usually focus on tone because I think that policy substance matters above all else. But again, during times of crisis, like politically speaking, it's very easy for you to rack up points by just acting like a grown-up. And here he is tweeting in all caps, 
during a crisis, making this cryptic tweet about something that we're all paranoid about currently, watching, we're glued to our televisions. I know I'm researching COVID-19, watching videos on it, trying to, you know, inform myself as much as possible. So we all want to hear what the president has to say, even if we don't like him. And yet, this is what he does. Like, he just squanders any political capital he has because he just, he can't not humiliate himself. He has to act like a fucking big baby embarrassing so i mean it's not like this is surprising but like i was almost like going to give him credit because he seemed to be taking it more seriously i mean we can't forget the fact that he botched covid19 like he didn't take coronavirus serious he dismissed it referred to it as a hoax or implied it was a hoax and you know he tried to write that wrong presumably and act like a grown-up at least try to be a leader pull pull up his pants, you know, uh, put on his big boy pants, and yeah, that lasted like five minutes. What a fucking dipshit Donald Trump is. In an interview with Jake Tapper on CNN, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez talked a little bit about COVID-19 and what needs to be done in order to protect Americans. And the reason why this interview stood out so much to me is because we've been talking a lot lately about leadership and, you know, how Trump is incapable of being a leader. Joe Biden has pretty much been MIA for the last week. And Bernie Sanders is currently leading. His, he's mobilizing his supporters to donate to coronavirus relief efforts, but the media won't talk about it. So to see someone nationally be a leader and, you know, tell us what solutions need to be implemented... I think this is important and matters because people are scrambling to find anything to take comfort in. They're looking for a leader and they don't know what active measures need to be taken, right? In order to stop this from spreading and stop, you know, us from going into economic ruin personally. So AOC basically laid it all out. And I thought that what she said here, it showed why she is such a valuable leader in this country. One of the things that we're hearing over and over again from hospitals, again, is this point on personal protective equipment. There are not enough face masks, gloves, ventilators, hospital beds to get us through this. Many hospitals are already at capacity or are approaching capacity, and there is kind of no real stream in sight from the federal government on where these materials are coming from. You know, companies are donating what they can. That is great. It is not enough. And the fact that the president has not really uh, invoked the Defense Production Act for the purpose of, manufa of emergency manufacture is going to cost lives. The FEMA administrator, I asked him about that. He said, it's not needed because so many American companies are stepping up to the plate and volunteering to do the right thing. Your response? It is absolutely needed. You know, we are thankful to anyone who's pitching in on this effort, but we are nowhere near the beds, the capacity and the capacity uh, that we need in this country. And the you know, we're hearing it every step of the way from this administration. First, we were hearing it was a hoax. Then we were hearing that everything was fine. Then we were hearing that the fundamentals of the economy was OK until the crash comes. And we cannot wait until people start really dying in large numbers to start production, especially of compli more complicated equipment like ventilators and hospital beds. We need to start this production right now to get ready for the surge that is coming in two to three weeks. Let's turn to Congress right now. Negotiations are, are ongoing on an economic stimulus package. Chief White House Economic Advisor Larry Kudlow said yesterday it could be as high as $2 trillion. You, you've suggested that's still not enough. If you were writing this bill, how much would you spend and where would the money go? Well, I think uh, first and foremost, there is almost no number too small. I don't think a lot of people out there really understand the systemic shock that is being experienced in the economy right now. You know, folks are comparing this to 2008. This is very, very different than even 2008, because what we have seen is that almost overnight, our entire economy, even the felt economy from jobs, is seizing almost overnight. So the question is not just the size, but what we are doing with those funds. Because if we are having a huge package, and this is something for people to look out for, when this package rolls out, there is no reason for corporate bailouts to be included in an emergency relief package. We should be focusing is unemployment expanding? Are we getting checks in people's hands? Are we suspending mortgage, rent, and, and debt payments? If we're able to do that, 
if we're able to get money into households and stop the bleeding with, with pauses on money going out of households, then we can get working families through this thing. But if all of this money is going to bailing out the airline industry in a way that does not help workers, if, we're, if it's going to bailing out banks and other industries without helping workers, then it's, then it's not going to be enough. And in fact, it could be too big. So it's really about how we're using these funds. So um, you, you're, you seem to be suggesting that you support, as, as a lot of people do in both parties, direct payments uh, to the American people. Uh, some Democrats have said that, that the $1,200 figure that's been proposed is way too small. How, how much money do you think the government should be giving the public directly? And it should, should it go to everyone or just people who need it? Well, so the Financial Services Committee uh, actually released their own plan. And I, I am very supportive of that plan, which has about $2,000 uh, this month for every American with an additional $1,000 uh, per child. But in addition to that, it stops payments. So it stops, it halts mortgage payments, rent payments, and all major consumer debt. And that is the key, because when you're able to stop the money going out, then that money that you do give goes um, a, a much longer way. So I'm very supportive of both of those measures. The Democrats are truly lucky to have her. And it's really a shame that she has to share a party with people like Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden, because they're just they're diametrically opposed and they don't deserve to benefit from her credibility, you know, and her you know, vision and leadership. They don't deserve her. But everything she said there was incredibly crucial. First of all, she made it very clear that the thing to do now is for Trump to utilize the, Def the Defense Production Act and let's make some medical equipment. Like the number one thing we are hearing from healthcare providers and doctors and professionals is that they're running out of medical equipment, masks, ventilators, like, what are we doing? Like, we're talking about flattening the curve, and I think that's really important. It's why we have to practice social distancing. But if we can't flatten the curve and hospitals become overburdened, we also have to prepare for that situation as well because we can't afford not to be prepared. We can't afford to, you know, assume that social distancing is going to work or, you know, a Wuhan-style lockdown is going to work. We have to prepare for the worst hope for the best. And the fact that Trump isn't utilizing the Defense Production Act is such a missed opportunity. It shows that he doesn't really know what he's doing. Like, he's in over his head. And I'm glad that she said that. Now, at the rate that we're going, unless we take substantial action and we do prepare for hospitals around the country being overburdened, we could be worse off than Italy or Spain. And I'm not being hyperbolic. The rate to which corona tests are coming back positive is growing faster than any other country in the world. Now, part of that is because we're finally actually making testing more available and easier to access, mostly for rich people. But slowly but surely, more people are getting tested, hence why the number is going up. But as we kind of learn just how bad the uh, pandemic is going to get, the depths of it, we have to prepare for everything. And the fact that we're not, it just is so frustrating. And, you know, at a time when we should be making direct cash payments to Americans, our number one priority, that's not what we're doing. And she spoke to that as well. She talks about how the government can take meaningful action to make sure that working Americans don't suffer if we, in fact, face a recession. And it's not going to be a 2008-style recession. Like, we're talking... Great Depression, or worse, possibly, based on current projections. I mean, if we actually get to 30% unemployment, that would surpass Great Depression levels of unemployment. It would be unthinkable. It would be a disaster. So there are things we can do, though, but they don't want to do that. Republicans don't want to actually ameliorate this crisis. They care about doing the bidding of their corporate donors. And it seemed like for a second, maybe they would try to throw the American people a bone because they probably recognize that capitalism can't function if the working class has no money to buy the goods and services produced by capitalists. However, 
um, the fact that they're prioritizing corporate bailouts, it tells you exactly where their priorities lie. They never for a second actually cared about the American people. They only care about Americans in so far as they are some benefit to American corporations and elites. But so long as we're unable to contribute to large multinational corporations and American corporations, then our lives then become meaningless. Protecting us is only important insofar as it doesn't hurt the economy. So the fact that we even have to debate this long about what to do, it is absolutely mind-boggling. Because, like, you can leave workers and normal Americans stranded for years, decades, that's what they've been doing. But when push comes to shove, if we see a 30% worst-case scenario unemployment rate, if we see... Thousands of people kicked out because they can't afford to pay rents. If we see an increase in homelessness, I mean, fuck all of these bailouts for companies, the oil industry, the airlines. That doesn't matter because if Americans can't afford airline tickets, if they can't afford to spend money and stimulate the economy, capitalism can't survive. So you have to at least provide the bare minimum to Americans and in this crisis giving them the bare minimum assuring that they're not going to lose everything is the bare minimum and it seems swift it seems drastic right to consider direct cash payments to people universal basic income temporarily but that's what you have to do if you want the system to remain in place because you know people are very apathetic and complacent generally speaking when it comes to politics but if you don't do anything as they watch their livelihoods being taken away from them, that's when we're going to go into full crisis mode. Because people are only going to be apathetic insofar as you keep them at least a little bit comfortable. But when you strip away that comfort and take everything away from them, that's when things start to get rough. Rough for lawmakers, that is. On Monday, we finally heard from Joe Biden for the first time since March 17th, which is when he gave a really unusual victory speech after winning three more primaries. And in case you missed it, this is how that went. Oh, <laughs> thanks. 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 Okay. You doing okay? Yeah? Need any help? <laughs> now, before that weird thing that happened, I don't even know how to describe it, the last time we heard from him was when he did this virtual town hall on COVID-19, and as The Verge's McKenna Kelly describes, it was a technical nightmare, and if you watched it live, parts of it just didn't work, like the audio was cutting out, and then other parts of it, his brain wasn't working, he was wandering off the screen, it was just a complete mess. Oh. No exceptions. That's why we're connecting virtually today. We're going to have to get better at the technical side of this. No president can promise to prevent future outbreaks. But I can promise you that when I'm president, I'm able to prepare better, respond better, and cover better. Science. Was, I was one of the sponsors of the Endangered Species Act. And one of the other things we've done is we in the state of Delaware, for example, set up the coastal zone legislation, which means that they can't build any factories or any, any, anything within one mile of the estuary of the Delaware River and the Atlantic Ocean and the Chesapeake. And so but the whole point of this is that we can do a lot to deal with endangered species. And one of the things I would like to raise is that we have to deal with this on an international basis as well. Yeah. So, look, I understand that it's his team's strategy to hide him away from the public. I get that. I think it's actually a smart strategy, and they executed it well throughout the course of the primary. But you're the front runner now. You will very likely be the Democratic Party's nominee. And Donald Trump is bungling his response to COVID-19. So this is a political opportunity. Like, you can step up and be the leader that Americans are looking for currently and I get that he's prone to fuck-ups and his staff still wants to hide him, 
But regardless, I mean, you have to be the leader. You wanted to be president. You still do, I'm assuming. So step up. The mere fact that he hasn't shown his face, it's giving people who uh, propped him up, members of the Democratic Party elite and their loyalists, a little bit of buyer's remorse because they're realizing maybe we made a mistake. For example, Daily Coast founder Marcos Melitz has tweeted, why isn't Biden leading the Democratic response to coronavirus every single day? Why cede the ground to Trump's propaganda? If Biden won't do it, make it Warren. Just find someone. Yeah, well, I mean, this is your guy. This is who you all propped up. So, um, you made your bed. Lie in it. Now, what he's missing here is that there actually is someone who is stepping up. Bernie Sanders. He mobilized his base of small donors to raise $2 million for coronavirus relief efforts. But the problem is that Bernie's bad and everyone else is good. So the media, they can't actually give Bernie Sanders credit for this because the primary isn't technically over. And if they give him too much credit, then voters might see that he's actually a better leader than Joe Biden and opt for him in the remaining primaries. So they're just ignoring that. And as a result, um, Joe Biden is ceding ground to Donald Trump. I agree with Marcos Melitzis there. Never thought I'd say that. And what's interesting is that the individual on the Democratic Party side who is the most visible at this time is New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. And he's just there. Like, people are gravitating towards him because he's on TV, and it seems as if he's exhibiting leadership qualities. Now, I think that he's botched the COVID response because he waited too long to enact all of these measures that he needed to enact. I mean, it's, it's a little too late, right? But I mean... The fact that he's present and it seems like he's doing something, even if his response is inadequate, he's just there. So it led to the Democratic Party's base uh, really wanting him to be the president, not Joe Biden, because President Cuomo started trending on Twitter and um, <laughs> uh, just days before, where's Biden was trending on Twitter. So do you understand? Like, Joe Biden is basically about to wrap up this primary when more votes take place, if we continue on this path with his momentum, and Democrats are already looking elsewhere for leadership. That's a really, really bad sign, because it shows you that Joe Biden may have even less support than Hillary Clinton had. In fact, I would guess that he, had less, he has less support than Hillary Clinton had. So, I mean, you, you can't just go MIA for six days straight if you are likely to be the Democratic Party's nominee and we have this global crisis. What are you doing? You can't retreat to your house. You have to come out and be a leader. Say something. But don't worry because um, he did speak up. He gave us a sign that he's still alive because, yes, there are people that were, you know, at first jokingly saying, hey, where's Joe Biden? Is he still alive? Maybe he should take a picture with the current newspaper. But then, you know, on day four, day five, People started to get a little bit more serious and ask, wait, is Joe Biden still alive? Like, literally? Um, but rest assured, because his staff, his press secretary, Simone Sanders, did let us know that he never left us because he made an epic appearance during DJ D-Nice's Instagram live stream and he dropped an epic thumbs up. Nice. Now, I know what you're thinking. Simone Sanders probably just logged in to Joe Biden's official Instagram account, sent the thumbs up emoji and then screenshotted it and then shared it to Twitter. I know. <laughs> but, you know, um, finally, he did make his triumphant return or not so triumphant return on the 23rd, but not before providing us with an excuse as to why he wasn't present more often. He told ABC News that he was setting up a home studio to do more regular broadcasts. Quote, the bottom line is that everything from providing better access to where I physically live and be able to broadcast from there, as well as our headquarters, is underway. We've hired a professional team to do that now, Biden told reporters. It's a little above my pay grade as to how we do that, but that's desperately what we're trying to do because I want to be in daily or at least, you know, significant contact with the American people and communicate what I would be doing, what I think we should be doing, and how we should be doing it. But I promise you that's on the way. Hopefully, God God willing, by Monday. A source with knowledge of the campaign said Biden's team is working on scaling up that infrastructure and dealing with the realities of Biden's Wilmington home, like the fact that there aren't particularly high ceilings, which can make lighting a challenge. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So the reason why he's gone MIA for six days is because 
uh, they couldn't get the lighting right. You could have gone on CNN, MSNBC, I'm sure they would have loved to hear from you. No, you know, it was because he's setting up this new home studio and it's so difficult to get the lighting right. You know, uh, forget the fact that Bernie Sanders hosted a fireside chat just using ordinary lamps while Joe Biden, you know, uh, had a whole team and they couldn't even get basic lighting figured out. But I mean, during a crisis, there's no excuse. Like, we should be hearing from you regularly if you want to convince the American people that you are the better leader now. Like, that's what you're doing. That's the campaign right now. We're not talking about anything but COVID-19 because this is what is affecting people's lives the most. So you have to be a leader. You have to assure them that we're going to be okay. We're going to make it through this. But the fact that you went missing, that's just not a good look. Like, do you not want to win? Like, I have my doubts that he even wants to beat Donald Trump because if you do something like this, it just it, it's idiotic. I mean... Turn on your phone. You don't need the perfect setup. Just turn on your phone, hit record, and then upload that to YouTube. And if you don't know how to do that, have one of your team members do it for you. Have one of your grandchildren do it for you. The granddaughter that he kisses on the mouth looks young enough, so I mean, I'm sure that she'd know how to do it. This isn't hard. Just figure it the fuck out. But regardless, I mean, it took six days, but we still heard from him. And um, it went about as well as you would expect any Joe Biden live stream to go. His teleprompter malfunctioned, and um, <laughs> just watch. My principal focus today and every day will be on what we should do to get this response fixed to save lives, to provide economic assistance to the tens of millions of Americans who need it and they need it now and are going to need it in the weeks and months ahead. It starts with adopting a mindset of real urgency. For too long, the warning signs were ignored. We need to activate the reserve corps of doctors and nurses and beef up the number of responders dealing with the crush, these crush of cases. And, uh, and in addition to that, uh, in addition to that, we have to uh, make sure that we, uh, we are in a position that we are, well, let me, let me go to the second thing. I've spoken enough of that. The president must use the Defense Production Act to radically increase the supply of critical goods needed to treat patients and protect our health care workers and first responders, including the protective gear like face masks and critical equipment like ventilators so desperately needed in our hospitals. It means working with all our allies and partners to get supplies from overseas when available, dispatching U.S. military assets to retrieve them quickly if they are available. It means federal coordination of the supply chains to accelerate deliveries and get them to the right places at the right time and much more. And we need to build an arsenal of democracy in, as we did in 1940. We can take, we, we, we can make a personal productive equipment. Look, here's the deal. We have to do what we did in the 40s and the 20s, and the 2020s. And we can do that. We need to build a medical arsenal here. Unfortunately, as of last night, President Trump and Mitch McConnell were offering a plan to let big corporations off the hook. They proposed a $500 billion slush, slush fund for corporations with almost no conditions. Under their plan, the Trump administration could even allow companies to use the money that they're being given to them by taxpayers' money to buy back stocks, increase executive pays, if that's what the Secretary of Treasury decided. They wouldn't have to make commitments to keep workers employed, these big corporations. They wouldn't have to tell the American, the Americans where the money goes for months. <coughs> now, in case you were wondering, this is the like to dislike ratio on that video. <laughs> and um, his other streams aren't that different. And just right off the bat, I have a couple of questions. First of all, why did you use a green screen setup like that's now I can understand why it was more difficult to get the lighting correct. Like just go by a window and film. So you made it more difficult on yourselves. And second of all, why is the ticker on the bottom of the screen static? Why isn't it like scrolling? Why do you have parts of it cut off if you're not going to make it scroll? Like there are so many questions and it's still difficult for me to believe that he had a team set this up. But still, you know, I'm not going to take issue with the substance, because I do think that if you just strip away all of the malfunctions, you know, the brain farts, 
The substance was okay. You know, he called on Trump to fully utilize the Defense Production Act. He was right to call for more tests and to condemn Donald Trump's slow response. But saying the right thing alone, it isn't enough. And he did make some good points. And, uh, you know, this needed to be said. He said that, you know, the Republican Party, they're just passing a bill that is corporate welfare. It's tantamount to corporate welfare because they're bailing out the companies, the large multinational corporations, and they're not looking at helping workers enough. But, you know, when you're trying to prove who's the real leader, you also have to propose solutions. And the thing about Joe Biden is that, you know, he hasn't talked much about policy. He's had nothing but platitudes. And you can condemn Donald Trump and the Republicans. But if you don't come with your own solution, then none of this means anything. Like, you can criticize what Donald Trump is doing, but you have to offer solutions. That's part of proving that you're the better leader. But this is his solution to, you know, corporate welfare. On Sunday, his campaign tweeted, I am calling on every CEO in America to publicly commit now to not buying back their company's stock over the course of the next year. As workers face the physical and economic consequences of coronavirus, our corporate leaders cannot cede responsibility for their employees. Yeah, that's not good enough. You're running to be the president. So you should call on Congress to enact legislation that bans them from buying their stock back. Like, the fact that this is legal should be an outrage to everyone, but for you to just say, oh, I'm calling on them to not do this. I'm calling on these private companies with a fiduciary responsibility to increase shareholder value at all costs, to just do the right thing, do the moral thing, think ethically for once. I mean, how is this different than when Hillary Clinton said, I went to Wall Street and I said, you cut it out. It's not. This is feckless leadership. So, I mean, not only is he showing to all of us that he doesn't have what it takes to lead at a moment when Americans are looking for anyone to be a leader, hence why President Cuomo was trending, but he doesn't even offer us solutions. Now, look, maybe I'm being too unfair to Joe Biden. Maybe I'm being as unfair to him as MSNBC is to Bernie Sanders. But I'm sorry, you had a chance for real leadership in this country. We, we could have got Bernie Sanders... And they opted for this guy, who struggles to articulate himself, who can barely spit out a coherent sentence, who went MIA for six days. That's who we're supposed to look to as the alternate to Donald Trump, who's having a meltdown and still throwing temper tantrums and refuses to be a leader. Like, the situation is so grim in America because we have Donald Trump, dipshit, or Joe Biden, dipshit. Which melting brain boomer do you want? The orange one or the white one? Pick one. I mean, that that's the options that we're presented with. So I'm sorry that I feel a little bit more, uh, or sound a little bit more pessimistic than usual to be specific, but I mean, the situation just sucks. And, you know, the Democratic Party loyalists who are only now seeing it, who are only now experiencing buyer's remorse, maybe you should have listened to us all along when we warned you about Joe Biden. Maybe, you know, Obama, who decided to make everyone get out of the race, convince them to drop out, to endorse Joe Biden. Maybe he should be a leader. Step up. We know that you did this, Obama. Come out of hiding. You wanted Joe Biden. This is your guy. So step up because we need some alternative to Donald Trump and Joe Biden just isn't that. He's bungling it. So somebody on the Democratic Party side, take responsibility for this. This is the mess that you created once again. So the Democratic Party establishment did everything in their power to shove Joe Biden down our throats. And now that he will likely become the Democratic Party's nominee, they're realizing, oh, wait, I forgot that he's such a terrible candidate that he's probably going to lose to Donald Trump. Now, I think that there's a good portion of the Democratic Party, elected Democratic Party people, who don't actually care if the Democratic Party nominee loses to Donald Trump because... Trump is someone who can unite Democrats, they can fundraise off of him, so it's not really the worst case scenario for them if they can sit on their ass for four more years and fearmonger about Donald Trump and not actually resist him. But there are people who I think actually do want to beat Donald Trump. I think that most Democrats probably want to beat Donald Trump, but now that he is likely to be the nominee, you know, everything is just laid out in front of them. His flaws they realize he's not a good candidate. And part of the problem is that 
He can't attract young people, and this is something that was obvious. Nonetheless, now they're grappling with it, and uh, they're realizing he's got a really tough, you know, job ahead of him at convincing people to come out and vote for him. So as Sahil Kapoor of NBC News explains, voters under 45 continued to support Bernie Sanders by huge margins in Florida, Illinois, and Arizona, even as other groups came around to Biden. The gap has been largest with voters in their 20s or teens, mirroring a problem that hurt Hillary Clinton in key states in 2016, a lack of excitement among the young. I'm deeply concerned about the impact that a lack of enthusiasm from young voters could have in a general election, said Neil Shroka, a spokesman for Democracy for America, a progressive advocacy group that backs Sanders. The consistent concern has been that nominating Vice President Biden would be essentially a repeat of the 2016 election. Failing to excite young voters in the primary has been a significant red flag for Democrats in recent decades, Shroka said. Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, who were backed by young people, went on to win the election while Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, and Al Gore lacked that enthusiasm and ended up losing. Voters under 30 made up 19% of the electorate in 2016 and in 2012, but Hillary Clinton's margin of victory with this group was five points lower than Obama's, according to exit polls. The numbers were devastating in swing states that decided the election. In 2012, Wisconsin voters under 30 backed Obama by 23 points. In 2016, that group dipped as a share of the electorate and Clinton won them by a mere three points. In 2012, Pennsylvania voters under 30 supported Obama by 28 points. In 2016, they favored Clinton by 9 points. The Biden campaign sees three major differences with Clinton's 2016 campaign, according to a source familiar with its thinking. The first is that Trump is president. Unlike four years ago, when many young people were complacent because they assumed he'd lose. The second is that Biden's 2020 platform is more progressive than Clinton's was in 2016. And the third is that Biden and Sanders like each other personally which will make it easier to coalesce. Okay, so there's quite a bit that I want to say about that. Um, the first that I want to point out is that um, not only is this a problem, but I see no hope of this problem improving for Joe Biden because the recommendations that we've seen here from polling experts, at least, you know, Andrew Bauman was one of them that was quoted in this article. The things that he recommends aren't going to suffice. So he says, look, if Joe Biden were to adopt some of Sanders policy proposals like anti-corruption measures really go, you know, um, full force focus on climate change, or if he had a meeting with Sunrise, maybe that could help. Um, let me just say firsthand, as a millennial, that's not going to help. And the three differences that his campaign cites, like he admits that this is an issue, but the reason why he thinks that he's in a better position than Clinton is because, well, there's a number of factors here. Trump is president now, so that might galvanize the Democratic Party electorate, including young people, to come out and vote for him. Except there's an issue with that line of logic. Now that Donald Trump is the incumbent there's no fears about what he could be. We know what he could be. We've dealt with him for four years. So that effect to galvanize voters, I think, has diminished since 2016. Because in 2016, we didn't know what to expect with Donald Trump. Would we look like fascist Germany? Or would we see just another George W. Bush-esque Republican, neoconservative, um, xenophobe who, you know, is fear-mongering about immigrants and is dog-whistling left and right. What is it going to look like? Now we know what that's going to look like. And the problem is that young people know that Joe Biden isn't going to improve their lives. The same conditions that led to Donald Trump's electoral success will remain present after four years of Joe Biden. So I don't actually think that Donald Trump is going to be as good of a mobilizer as they're thinking. I mean, don't bank on this. Sure, it's going to encourage some people to come out, but it's not going to be everything. Now, the second thing they say is that Joe Biden's platform is actually more progressive than Hillary Clinton's. Now, that's technically true, at least when it comes to healthcare, because Joe Biden is openly supporting a public option. Hillary Clinton wouldn't even admit to supporting a public option or agree to support a public option more specifically. So he's to the left of her marginally. But the problem is that like Hillary Clinton, voters by and large don't know what his platform is because he doesn't talk about policy. It's always orange man bad, Republicans bad, and voters want to come out and will only come out to vote for something, not vote against someone. And Democrats just haven't realized 
that that's what motivates people. It's not, you know, voting against this evil person. It doesn't really matter. Like, you have to give them something. Uh, something that they know will change their lives. A policy that, you know, you have been fighting for for decades. And Joe Biden just has none of that. Everything he's fought for has been destructive. The crime bill, um, you know, Wall Street relief. Like, he is the quintessential neoliberal corporate Democrat. So you're not going to convince people because everyone knows that you're a fraud. So, you know, when it comes to the public option, even though he's to the left of Hillary Clinton on that, he supported a public option when he ran with Obama and they didn't even propose it. So the question is, why are we supposed to believe that you've changed your mind when the health insurance industry has been betting on you to be successful and to save them from Medicare for all. Like you're in their tank. They're raising money for you. They're donating to you. So why should we believe that you'd even go so far as to even give us a public option? We don't. And that's a problem. Now, the last thing that they say is that um, Biden and Sanders like each other personally. Yeah, I couldn't care less. I think this is a non-factor. Bernie Sanders can say how much Joe Biden is his friend over and over and over again, and it doesn't make me like Joe Biden more. It actually makes me like Bernie Sanders less. Literally. That doesn't matter. Voters don't care about friendships in Washington, D.C. Couldn't care less. But that's not to say that there isn't something that Joe Biden can do. An extreme measure he would never consider, but something that would, theoretically help him win over young voters. And he's not going to like this, but if you really want to win, you can't win without young voters. And Kyle Kalinske tweeted this out. The only way Joe Biden can earn my vote in the general election is to pick Bernie Sanders or Nina Turner for vice president. Sign the petition for that here if you agree with me. Now, I'll link you to his petition. Look, I'll just say first off, Joe Biden is not going to agree to this. I don't think that Kyle Kalinske think he's going to agree thinks he's going to agree to this, he's most likely going to pick some corporate clown um, like Stacey Abrams, friend of Mike Bloomberg. So he's not going to listen. Uh, but if in a hypothetical situation, he chose Bernie Sanders as VP, to me, that wouldn't necessarily matter as much because he's still president and Bernie wouldn't really I mean, maybe he'd influence him to a degree, but it doesn't matter. But if he picks Nina Turner, for me, I would vote for Joe Biden in that very statistically unlikely circumstance. Why? Because, look, here's the thing. He can say that he supports some of Sanders' policy proposals, but that doesn't matter. Like, I don't even think it's necessary for him to say, I, you know, will fight for this policy or that policy that Sanders supports, it doesn't matter because we don't believe you. Like all these financial contributions you are taking from every special interest, the military industrial complex, health insurers, big pharma, it doesn't matter. So we don't believe you. So any policy concession that he makes will not be enough. However, if he were to choose Nina Turner as VP, that would give at least me a reason to vote for him. And I don't speak for everyone. I'm sure people still wouldn't come out and support him. But the reason why I could justify voting for Joe Biden in that instance is because that gives us a chance at a progressive president in the future. If you pick Nina Turner, that sets her up for a presidential run in 2024, 2028. And that's good. Because currently... Progressives are so down and demoralized because there's no successor to Bernie Sanders. Who's next? I can't think of anyone. Anyone that wants to run or is eligible to run. AOC probably won't run. She's not going to want to do that, you know, for decades. So who's going to carry the torch? We know that, you know, this movement, it can exist without Bernie Sanders. But leadership is really, I think one of those things that makes movements, it gives them more staying power. Like Occupy, I feel, would have lasted longer had it had real leadership, but it, you know, it didn't organize in that way. They didn't want leadership and they prided themselves on that. But I think that you do need a leader to kind of help, you know, mobilize people and galvanize certain blocks of the electorate. And so if we're able to look to Nina Turner, who I think would try to influence Joe Biden and wouldn't sell out. I think that that is one way that he could win over young people. One of the only ways. Now, I will say this. He may just be unable 
to win over young people. That's a possibility. It's probably the most likely scenario because they just don't believe him. So young people, they have to put up with voter suppression, voter ID laws. They're not going to pay the cost to vote if they don't feel as if there's going to be a high enough reward. So you've got to you've got to make sure that they feel as if it's worth it to vote for you. And Nina Turner as VP, if she would even want to do this because he's a horrible person, that would be the only situation that I could honestly see people getting out to vote. Now, I do think that more voters would respond if Bernie Sanders was VP, but if you're giving me the choice, I would pick Nina Turner because Bernie's not going to want to run for president after Joe Biden. I don't think he's going to want to run for president again. And we need someone in the executive office who's a leader. Nina Turner is young. She is the most trusted among progressives. Nobody else can really carry the torch. Now, I'm going to say that I think that she should run for president in 2024, 2028, regardless if she's VP, because media propped up a mayor from, you know, um, South Bend, Indiana, and told us that he was qualified. So you can't say that someone like Nina Turner, who is a state senator, isn't qualified, because I do think that she is qualified. Um, but would this certainly help with, you know, the media at least in trying to take her more seriously or at least not downplaying her enough? Sure. So if you pick Nina Turner as VP, that'd give me something to vote for. Will he do this? No. I'm not going to say there's a 0% chance, but I'm going to say the chance of him picking Nina Turner is 0.001%. He's going to pick some type of corporate clown like Amy Klobuchar, but... If he was serious about winning over young voters, this is something he should consider. But I don't think he's serious about winning over young voters. I think he just doesn't care because he stated before he has no empathy for us. He's told us to fuck off. He'd veto Medicare for all. So I think that, you know, he's just going to try to win without us. It's possible, but is it um, going to be a lot harder for him? Yeah, it's going to be a lot harder for him. All right, folks, we've got some good news. Um, it's not the best news ever, but I'll take anything we can get. So voters living in 180 different countries who are Americans just participated in the Democratic Party primary. And even though there weren't that much delegates to be awarded, Bernie Sanders still won and he won overwhelmingly. So as Zach Montalero of Politico reports, Sanders won 58% of the vote, which included just under 40,000 Americans living abroad. And Sanders will be awarded nine delegates to the National Convention over the summer, according to the release from Democrats Abroad. Biden won 23% of the vote and will take home four delegates. Turnout was up 15% over 2016, Democrats Abroad said for the group's largest recorded primary. In-person voting took place place from March 3rd through March 10th at sites around the world. Voters could also submit electronic ballots. Americans living in the United Kingdom accounted for the most voters, 5,689, with Germany, Canada, France, and Mexico rounding out the top five. So there are two things I want to talk about. Why this is good news and may be a sign of what's to come, and why this might not necessarily matter too much, even if it is good news. So the first thing is that this is good news because even though the bar was low, we were just kind of looking for a sign of life. Like, is there anyone left who's voting in this primary that isn't willing to just suck it up and vote for Joe Biden? Are we just going to coordinate him or are we still going to make our voices heard? And voters overwhelmingly said, no, I support Bernie Sanders. I think that the vision that he is, you know, um, Putting forward, it's the vision that I agree with the most, and I don't care that Joe Biden is currently the front runner. I'm going to support Bernie Sanders, and it doesn't matter that Beto O'Rourke and Kamala Harris and uh, Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar all fell in line and backed Biden. I support Bernie Sanders. So this is this is good news. But <laughs> to um, put the brakes on the optimism just a little bit, um, on one hand, it's not. It may not matter because there aren't that much delegates that are going to be awarded. So it's certainly not enough to change the trajectory of this primary. Bernie gets nine delegates, Biden gets four, right? Now, could it be, you know, a sign that maybe there's this shift in momentum? Maybe Bernie is gaining? That's certainly possible. 
Um, but I will say that Bernie Sanders was kind of poised to win Democrats abroad because if you are living in the United Kingdom, Germany, France, you already are experiencing firsthand some of the policies that Bernie Sanders is proposing, right? So they have socialized medicine in the UK. What Bernie Sanders is asking for is socialized insurance. So it's not even as extreme. So of course, if you're living in the UK and you have any experience firsthand with their national health system, you're going to obviously realize that what Bernie Sanders is proposing is superior to Biden's vision of a public option, I guess. He proposed it before, but we didn't get that. I mean, that's obvious, right? Bernie Sanders actually has policies that are not radical because they've been implemented throughout the world. But a problem with this is this sample of voters, Democrats abroad, they're likely not representative of Democrats living here at home. Because if you have exposure to these types of social democratic policies, then they're less, you know, they're they're less foreign to you, for lack of a better word. So you're familiar with them. They don't seem extreme. So, you know, people at home, they might still kind of just fall in line because momentum is a difficult thing to shift. And, you know, it's going to be that much more tough for us to get a swing in momentum because of COVID-19. Like, Bernie Sanders is currently doing all of these phenomenal things. He's holding almost daily town halls where people can ask questions to him and healthcare professionals or other policymakers. He had his entire um, base raise $2 million for corona relief efforts. I mean, he's doing so much, but they're ignoring it. And they're focusing on coronavirus, which they should be. But when they bring in the political aspect, they talk about Donald Trump or Andrew Cuomo. So, I mean, it, it's tough to get that that switch to flip. So it goes from Biden to Bernie in terms of momentum. But this is good news. And whenever there's good news in dark times, I think we should grab onto it and hold onto it for as long as we possibly can. Because... We need it right now. I'm not saying that this is a sign of things to come, but, you know, does it give me a little bit of hope? A little bit. Not too much, but a little bit. Overall, I'm still very cynical, uh, very pessimistic, because our future is uncertain. I don't know what's going to happen. We have Donald Trump, who is completely incapable of being a leader, and then we have Joe Biden, who's feckless and mostly absent. Bernie was our chance to really not just change the country, but save the world. And people in this primary, they decided to go for Joe Biden. Because the media is very effective at brainwashing people. But I don't have to get into that because this is supposed to be a good news video. So I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to self-censor and we'll just say, congratulations, Bernie, for winning this. So it's evident that the DNC and the Democratic Party's biggest loyalists, their, you know, hacks and media, they want to wrap this Democratic Party primary process up already. They don't want to hear what the rest of the voters have to say. They just want it to be over with. And they want Bernie Sanders to drop out. Just last week, uh, or maybe the week before, I put out a video talking about how Democratic Party hacks like Bakari Sellers and, you know, journalists, quote unquote journalists like Jennifer Rubin, want him out of the race, but he hasn't left. Now, I don't necessarily know how long he's going to stay in. I personally believe that he should stay in all the way into the convention, and I'll make that case in this video. But according to Washington Post's Jenna Johnson, he is weighing out his options currently. And he has three options according to his closest confidants, according to the Washington Post. One, keep his campaign technically active, but forego airing attack ads on Joe Biden. Two, stay in the race and aggressively compete. I'm assuming that means airing attack ads against Joe Biden. Or three, end the campaign. Drop out, call it quits, endorse Joe Biden. There's a lot of uncertainty currently, not just in the world, but in American politics. And if there's still time, I want to make my pitch. He should opt for... Number two, don't drop out, don't endorse Joe Biden, don't withhold your criticisms of Joe Biden. Bernie Sanders shouldn't just choose 
to, you know, stay in the race. But I'm going to explain why I think it's absolutely necessary for him to stay in the race. Um, first of all is just the easiest um, argument. Democracy. What we've seen is a competing vision between Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden. Half the country hasn't voted yet. I haven't made my voice heard. They're offering two competing worldviews. Joe Biden is offering the status quo, business as usual, and Bernie Sanders is offering an alternative vision. You shouldn't deny voters the chance to make their voices heard, even if it doesn't necessarily change the outcome if Bernie stays in the race. We at least need to gauge where the Democratic Party electorate is at. And maybe this, you know, process isn't going to tell us much, but at least, you know, it's going to give us some indication of where voters are. How many Democratic Party voters at this time think that Joe Biden is the best person? How many think it's Bernie Sanders? Like, we just need to give people the chance to make their voices heard. New York hasn't voted yet. My state hasn't voted yet, as I stated. So we shouldn't deny voters that chance, right? These are two very, very different views of the world, and I think they should be allowed to compete. Now, another reason why Bernie Sanders should stay in the race is because so long as he's an active competitor, that forces Joe Biden to do better. And as much as Democrats hate that, it's good for Joe Biden. Joe Biden wouldn't feel pressure to, you know, make these live streams if it weren't for Bernie Sanders. They would, his staffers would hide him away until September when it's time to debate Donald Trump. So Bernie Sanders forces Joe Biden to be a better candidate. I'm not saying that Biden is going to adopt the policies that Bernie Sanders wants, but he still has to compete in some way because it's not over yet. He could still technically lose, right? Bernie isn't mathematically eliminated. So Joe Biden has to do better by the mere fact that Bernie is remaining in the race. That's another reason why Joe Biden supporters even should want Bernie to stay in the race. And Bernie Sanders has leverage so long as he stays in the race and forces Joe Biden to compete. On top of that, Joe Biden doesn't have the support of young voters. Our voices matter. If you're a millennial or a Zoomer or a Gen Xer, I don't think that you should just be forced to support who, you know, these people in other states coronated as the nominee. I think that's bullshit. Joe Biden needs to be competitive. He has to win our votes. So let us make our voices heard in the states where we haven't voted yet. On top of that, you know, um, Bernie can still use his campaign to mobilize like he's been doing to um, help with COVID-19. I think that Bernie still has this huge grassroots army that can raise money for various causes. And sure, that technically won't just dissipate once he's out of the race, but it certainly is better to have this cohesive unit, this block of the Democratic Party mobilized and ready to respond to, you know, various crises that may pop up as a result of coronavirus, you know, directly and indirectly, how it impacts the country and the economy and disadvantaged and marginalized groups. So if I'm Bernie Sanders, I'm not going anywhere. I am staying in this race. I'm using the leverage that I have to make as big of a difference as I possibly can. And the biggest reason is that he should hold out because, you know, things can change. This is an unprecedented crisis that we are dealing with. Now, you know, my thinking was that if it didn't change after March 17th, then it's unlikely to change, but that doesn't mean that it's impossible. So he should stay in this race just in case it changes. Joe Biden is already proving that he is incapable of being a leader. That's why President Cuomo was trending because Democratic Party voters are already a little bit disillusioned with the choice that they made in propping up Joe Biden. So Bernie shouldn't go anywhere. He should stay in the race, let the rest of the country make their voices clear. We have two competing visions of America let us vote. Stay in the race. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain by staying in this race. And I don't think Bernie Sanders should drop out. No, I know that people are going to say that I'm being unrealistic and that, you know, I'm not willing to see the writing that's on the wall. No, I know that it's going to be difficult. Most likely, it will be Joe Biden who's the nominee. But is that a foregone conclusion? No, not necessarily yet. And if there's even just a little tiny glimmer of hope, I'm going to hang on to that until it's completely gone. So stay in the race, Bernie. Don't drop out. 
fight to the very end and fight aggressively. Because even though the Democratic Party is going to attack you for criticizing Joe Biden, one, it's going to make him do better, hopefully, and two, you're not going to win them over by doing what they want. They want you to drop out and endorse Joe Biden. And even if you do that, they're still not going to like you. So since they're not going to like you, fuck them. Stay in, compete, make Joe Biden do better, force him to be a better candidate, and maybe you can win. Who knows? It's unlikely, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. Crazier things have happened in this country. Joe Biden looked all but done after coming uh, in, what was it, like fifth? in New Hampshire. So things can change. This primary has been incredibly volatile. Just don't leave yet. I think that we need you to compete. We need you as a leader. And being in this race makes you a more visible leader. Don't, don't drop out yet. If you're watching this, then you probably don't need to be convinced at just how terrible of a human being Neera Tandon is, who is the president of the Center for American Progress. But she's also incredibly petty because for being in such a powerful position to where she has access to the entire Democratic Party establishment and not only access, influence, she spends like most of her day, and I'm going to guess and say like 40, maybe 50 percent, just arguing with Bernie Sanders supporters on Twitter. I've gotten into Twitter arguments with Neera Tandon and was subsequently blocked. She is uh, blocking more people by the day. She's just, she's petty and it's, uh, it's kind of sad, right? Because you would think that being in a position of great influence and power, you'd at least grow up a little bit. Like, I don't even see, for all of Donald Trump's mean tweets, like, you don't see him responding to everyone in his mentions calling him a fraud. So for her, I mean, she's like hyper aware of all of the criticisms and yet she's not trying to do better. Instead, she's kind of like doubling down and she's just going back and forth. And it's it's so immature. And I'm not saying that I'm I'm better than that because I've gotten into a lot of Twitter arguments myself. But I mean, like, nobody's as bad as her. <laughs> she's such a petty person um, on top of being just genuinely evil, I think. But it's funny because finally somebody put her in her place. Um, she, as you all know, won't stop attacking Bernie Sanders. And she responded to a New York Times article saying this. We have a virus to deal with and more important issues, but for a campaign that was seen as too divisive by Democratic voters, which led them to look for alternatives, that the rationale for defeat is that it wasn't negative enough? That's not serious. Now, the speechwriter for the Sanders campaign, David Sirota, responded with a clapback that, um, I don't want to use this word to describe it, but I'm going to have to do it, even if it's cringe. It was epic. And I say that because, well, we'll just read it. You run a corporate-funded think tank whose legacy is undermining Medicare for All in the lead-up to a pandemic, and your personal claim to fame is reportedly outing a harassment victim, busting a union, and being affiliated with a campaign that lost to Trump. Maybe sit out a few plays. <laughs> Now, I am guessing that if he had a little bit more space, a little bit more characters, he would have included a lot more. How they omitted a portion of a report on profiling of Muslim Americans after Mike Bloomberg was in it, and he donated to the Center for American Progress. Like, this is a fraudulent organization run by a fraudulent ghoul, and there's, there's so many negative things to say about Neera Tandon. Like, I think that she is genuinely a bad person. Like, her organization is fighting to prop up war criminals like Benjamin Netanyahu, and they're fighting to stop Medicare for All, a policy that would save 68,000 lives every single year. Like, I know that people accuse me of being hyperbolic often because I use words like evil to describe politicians, but what else do you call this? What else do you call that? If you are actively stopping good and promoting bad in the world, I don't know what else to say to describe you. So I just had to share this. I thought that David Sirota's tweet was phenomenal. And I wish that more people would uh, respond to Neera Tandon like this. More people in positions of power and influence, that is, because she gets a pass from the Democratic Party establishment. Because a lot of people 
don't want her wrath because when you have power, when you have influence, you know, you you can say things. You can get away with a lot of things that normal people like you and I can't get away with. So I'm glad that someone at least was willing to stand up to her because the only way to deal with a bully is to stand up for yourself. And this is the only way to deal with her. After being criticized for hiding from the public for almost a week when he's very likely going to be the Democratic Party's nominee, Joe Biden finally decided to show his face on Monday and he made up for his absence by going on a media tour on Tuesday and it went about as good as you'd expect a Joe Biden media tour to go. And um, there's a series of clips that I want to show you that should definitely give people who supported Joe Biden at least, you know, a second thought at a minimum, but at worst, full on buyer's remorse because this man is not capable of leading. So first, watch this clip where he claims Donald Trump is soft on xenophobia and he describes him as a yo-yo. And now he's being mm -hmm. soft on his xenophobia in the past. So I just I just can't figure the guy. It's like, it's, I don't know, it's like watching a yo-yo. I shouldn't have said it that way. It's like watching. It feels that way. I want to ask. I want. <laughs> That's okay. That silence was painful. Oh, like it's it's physically cringeworthy. And my reaction as I watched that was basically the reaction that Joe Biden had on his face, albeit for different reasons. Now, in the same interview, he tried to make a point, <laughs> and, and then he just gave up. <laughs> Take a look. We have never, never, never failed to respond to a crisis as a people. And I tell you what, I'm so darn proud. And those poor people who have lost, you know, anyway. Mood. Now, in this next clip, same interview, mind you, he kind of gets into a little bit of a disagreement with himself, and then there's this, this back and forth between him and himself, and <laughs> um, the look on Nicole Wallace's face is going to forever be etched in my memory. We should be... We should be making those masks. We should be moving on those ventilators. We can do that. Why doesn't mm -hmm. he just act like a president? That's a stupid way to say you it. You know, I Donald guess, Trump was really asked on... He... Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I probably best I don't. Vote for Joe Biden, they said. He's our best shot against Donald Trump, they said. <laughs> like, at, at a certain point, I feel like <laughs> being incredibly pessimistic and cynical just turns into laughing at the horrible situation that we're all in. Like, we're in the apocalypse, and we're all going down. Like, <laughs> we're, about, we're about to hit an iceberg. We're all on the Titanic. And, you know, what do you do but laugh? And let me just say this. To the viewers at home, you deserve someone who looks at you the way that Nicole Wallace looks at Joe Biden as his brain starts melting on national television. <laughs> now, um, moving on to a different, different interview, he went on The View and he made an incredibly sound and cogent point for once about Trump's handling of COVID-19 and whether or not people should return to work. I'm just kidding. Of course, what he said was completely incoherent. This is Sarah Haynes. In Hot Topics, we yes, talked sir. about Trump saying the government would reassess the recommended period for keeping businesses shut and people at home. Are you at all concerned, as Trump said, that we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself? We have to take care of the cure. That will make the problem worse no matter what. We have to take care of the cure. That will make the problem worse no matter what. I'm sitting here reading this quote back to myself over and over and over again. And like, I'm the math lady meme where numbers are like flying past my head. I'm literally crying. I don't know what to say. 
this man very clearly should not be the Democratic Party's nominee. And let me just say, I don't know what his staff gave him before that last debate or told him whatever their strategy was, whatever the particular substances that they gave to him were. I'd like to know, so please DM me. My uh, DMs on Twitter are open. If you follow me, just let me know um, because I want some of that because I mean, he's clearly in cognitive decline and it is genuinely sad. Like, yes, this is horrible because he's a bad politician. He's a bad person. His policies hurt people and won't protect people. But at the same time, like you can't not feel bad because this is clearly someone who's lost, who should be at home spending time with his grandchildren, um, keeping six feet, of course. But I mean, it just... He shouldn't be doing this, and this is a point that I've made consistently throughout the course of this primary. Joe Biden should not be doing this, and it's almost, it feels somewhat cruel to have his staffers parade him around when clearly he's not capable of doing this. Like, it's it's sad to watch. Like, I'm laughing not necessarily at Joe Biden, although kind of, but I'm laughing more at the situation because it's like, we're in the sequel of idiocracy but you know this is this is non-fiction like it, it's just it, it's the times that we're living in are so absurd that fiction couldn't even really capture just how strange the times are if we made up some type of alternate political reality about american politics but um let me move on because i have one last clip to show you and i think that this one i wanted to save for last because i think this is like a grand finale in a way, not necessarily because he messes up, but just because the exchange between him and Jake Tapper on CNN was just so cringeworthy um, and kind of funny. I had to share it. Sanders is, is ramping up for the next round of primaries, <coughs> including uh, in the state of New York. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. You know, you're supposed to cough into your elbow. I don't know, sir. That's, I learned that actually covering your White House. That's that, you no, actually, actually, that's true. But fortunately, I'm alone in my home. But that's okay. All right. I, I agree. You're right. You should just. It's just. It's kind of old school to do it with your hand. Do it into your elbow. You're supposed to do it. Um, Thank uh, you. Let me let me ask you. Um, given the the coronavirus pandemic, do you think the Democratic National Committee should call off uh, the planned in person Democratic convention this summer? No, I don't think so. I think we ought to be able to conduct our democratic processes as well as uh, deal with this issue. But look, that decision we made is a state of the nation at the moment. Um, but I don't think it should be called off, and I don't think we should call off any of the elections. I just, wow. And to his point about holding elections, the way that he kept repeatedly coughing into his hands is precisely why we shouldn't hold elections unless they are vote by mail. We need to do this. Will it be difficult to set up? Yes. But make it happen. We have no choice. Democracy must go on. But voting in person is dangerous because people like that will cough in their hands, touch voting machines, endanger workers at the poll who are oftentimes elderly. Like, what do you say? Like, I, I've worked in retail. I've worked in fast food. And let me just say, people are germ machines and they spread it without even thinking, like they cough on their hands, swipe their credit card, enter in their PIN number. It's it's disgusting. And as someone who is a germaphobe with, you know, uh, obsessive compulsive, compulsive disorder, um, I know firsthand how dirty people are because I'm very hyper aware of how people kind of just um, touch everything, touch their face. It's just you see germs spreading in real time. So the thought of even more people going to the polls during a global pandemic when the CDC and World Health Organization is definitely saying we have to social distance, we have to self-quarantine, it's, uh, it's, it's frightening, right, to be real. And can I just say that the coronavirus background that CNN has had on for the past week or so, it's a little creepy, kind of in poor taste. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe, you know, I shouldn't have said that. It doesn't matter. But, like, it just, it weirded me out in a way. So, I mean, look, I, I don't know what to say about this. We're seeing what was obvious for months. Joe Biden, clearly, he's not, he's not capable of running the country. And to put him up against Donald Trump, the likelihood of him beating Donald Trump, I think it's slim, you know, uh, unless the economy really does tank due to coronavirus. 
I, like, I don't know at this point in time, politics is so weird, but I mean, like, even if he's able to beat Trump, do we really expect him to be an adequate leader? Do we really expect him to respond to the needs of people? No, it's going to be his handlers and advisors running the show. And it's just, the situation is grim that, you know, I kind of, I feel like I have to laugh at it because if I don't, then all we have is just, you know, black pill, depression, sadness. So whatever joy we can take out of this horrible predicament that we're all in, I think we should we should take it and run with it. So if watching all of these cringeworthy Joe Biden interviews puts a smile on your face, don't feel bad about it. I'm not because um, sometimes reality is uh, stranger than fiction, and we are certainly in that time. The supposedly pro-life party has been saying a lot of really um, troubling things lately for a party that is so concerned with the health and well-being of other human beings. Because at a White House press briefing, Donald Trump admitted that he's willing to endanger the lives of Americans just to make sure we protect the stock market. He literally said that. And after he made this comment, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick of Texas went on Fox News in an interview with Tucker Carlson and basically echoed that same sentiment, saying, yeah, I think we should let old people die to make sure that we protect the profits of private companies. Now, every once in a while, Donald Trump will say something that's bizarre or unhinged. He'll get pushed back, and then he'll kind of walk back that statement. But he's not doing that this time, when we really need him to do that, when we need him to reconsider. Desperately so. Because he doubled down in an interview on uh, Fox News, and he said that not only is he willing to do this, to actually send people back to work, resume business as usual, regardless if people die, he's going to do it really soon. How soon? By Easter, which for those of you who don't know, is less than three weeks away. Take a look. During our town hall today, you threw out a date where you think America can be working again. And that's Easter Sunday. Yeah. That's 19 days from now. How did you come up with so, that day? Well, it's 19 days, but add another seven because we've been doing this now for seven. So that's from the time we heard about it. Seven to nine. From the time yeah. we, yes, it's from the time we, we close it up. So you could add seven to nine. Uh, look, Easter's a very special day for me. And I see it's sort of in that timeline that I'm thinking about. And I say, wouldn't it be great to have all of the churches full? You know, the churches aren't allowed, essentially, to have much of a congregation there. And most of them, I watched on Sunday, online. And he was terrific, by the way. But online is never going to be like being there. So I think Easter Sunday, and you'll have packed churches all over our country. I think it would be a beautiful time. And it's just about the timeline that I think is right. Yes, because packed churches is certainly the most beautiful thing that I can think about during a global pandemic. Like, this is absolutely irresponsible, borderline psychopathic, if not full-on psychopathic behavior. People are going to die. Those packed churches are going to be disease-spreading factories where COVID is going to fucking spread. Like, what are you doing? People who go to church disproportionately are the base of the Republican Party, elderly people. So they're more than willing to sacrifice their own base all to protect the gods of capitalism, to make sure the stock markets are doing okay, to make sure that the gears of the economy just uh, keep turning. This is so morally reprehensible. Like, anyone who votes for a Republican, their boomer base, acknowledge that they're talking about you. You're disposable to them. They're willing to sacrifice you to protect profits. Your life doesn't matter. So if you voted Republican, you've been duped. Now, the good news is there's still time to change it. But your votes for Republicans may have doomed us all. So if we weather this storm, right, there's a lot more that we have to deal with as a species because of what capitalism has done to our society climate change. This probably won't be the last global pandemic that we see. Um, we have to clean up the mess that this party, which is basically a death cult, has made. So stop voting for them. Now, this isn't surprising because we already knew that this is what, you know, Republicans prioritize. They put 
the profits over the health and well-being of people. It's always profits over people. That's all they care about. But what is honestly surprising to me is the fact that they're saying it so explicitly. Like, I expected them to just hint at this. I thought Republicans would use doublespeak or maybe accuse us of being hyperbolic when we actually call out their agenda to just let old people die to protect the profits of big business. But they're not even trying to hide their agenda. In fact, they're excitedly vocalizing to the world that they love this idea. So many Republicans are coming out in droves to say, yeah, you know what? If old people are going to die, I think that's fine so long as we protect the economy, which is a thing that we made up as human beings. Like, do you understand? Like, the economy, money, these things have no value without human beings there to value them. Do you understand that? But they don't care. They're willing to kill off their entire base to appease their corporate overlords, and I'm sure boomers will still happily vote Republican. So let me just give you a few examples of what Republicans have said in order to really vocalize their support for Trump's plan to send everyone back to work and endanger their lives. So right-wing radio host Jesse Kelly tweeted out, if given the choice between dying and plunging the country I love into a Great Depression, I'd happily die. All right, well, nobody's stopping you. But if you actually meant that, put your life at risk. Go bag groceries. Go ring up people. Be a cashier. Swap out your job for a cashier who probably would have a better talk show than you have. Like, actually do something that would make you vulnerable. But they can say this, and it doesn't mean anything because they're not vulnerable. They're protected in their studios. I know, I can stay home talking to my microphone and it's fine, but I worked retail before. I know the germs that people spread firsthand. They cough into their hands, use the credit card machines. It's absolutely disgusting. And these people who are ringing up groceries, healthcare providers, they are putting their lives on the line. And you're saying it's worth it? And you die? No, you don't mean that. You mean that you'd let the peasants die, not yourself. We all know if push comes to shove, that's what they're talking about. Now, another Republican idiot, Candace Owens, decided to chime in uh, with a platitude that Republicans often use. My freedom! She tweeted, To the frauds claiming we need to shut down society to protect the elderly World War II generation. World War II generation. We will die before we give up our freedom. This generation. We will give up every single one of our freedoms before we risk dying. Cowardice dressed up as nobility. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. Wear your masks. Give up your rights. Stay at home. But stop hiding behind the generation that gave you all of your freedoms to do it. Just admit that we are a coddled, fearful, egocentric generation of weak men. I'm sorry that people aren't willing to die for some abstract notion of freedom. But forcing people to work just to make sure that we protect the profits of industry, that doesn't sound like freedom to me. And I'm sorry, but this whole notion of freedom, if we're going to accept that that's what we're talking about, because freedom is irrelevant, she brought that into the conversation, freedom means nothing without people being alive to partake in said freedom. I mean, you have to be alive to be able to enjoy freedom, or any freedoms. If you are dead, you cannot enjoy freedom. If you are dead, you cannot contribute to the economy. And she says that we're hiding behind this generation. Um, so, Republicans are basically saying, let's sacrifice the lives of old people, mo mostly, to make sure that there's no recession. And... When we say no, don't kill people, you call us cowards, but yet you still claim to be pro-life? Like, you have to pick a side. Either you're pro-life or you're pro-death. The Republican Party has always been a pro-death party. They've been the party of death and destruction. They are the party that is absolutely the biggest cheerleaders imaginable for capitalism, right? So, I mean, like, we're speaking out trying to protect our loved ones, right? We oftentimes will be angry with boomers for ruining the economy and voting for Republicans and corporate Democrats. But at the end of the day, these people are our family members. They're our grandparents, our parents. So by us speaking up on their behalf, we're not the ones who are cowards. You're the fucking coward, Candace Owens. And again, these people can talk a really big game when they don't have to leave their homes. They don't have to actually go to work for a real job. 
They just have big fucking mouths. They talk into a microphone and they can say whatever they want without consequences and, you know, act as if they're, you know, they'd be noble and would sacrifice their own lives to save the economy when in actuality these cowards are talking about the peasants, not themselves. Now, it's funny because Glenn Beck said the same thing. He said, I'm willing to sacrifice my own life to save the economy. And just watch, I'll tell you why this is so idiotic coming from him of all people. Uh, I want to have a frank conversation with you and, and ask you where you stand. I'm, I mean, I'm in the danger zone. Uh, I'm right at the edge. I'm 56. In Italy, they're saying if you're sick and you're 60, don't even come in. So I'm in the danger zone. I would rather have my children stay home and all of us who are over 50 go in and keep this economy going and working. Even if we all get sick, I'd rather die than kill the country because it's not the economy that's dying, it's the country. You know, the happy music just doesn't really seem appropriate for the morbid, borderline genocidal conversation that he's having. But the reason why this isn't necessarily applicable to someone like Glenn Beck is because one, he's rich, so he's going to have access to the best healthcare in the world uh, that money can buy. And two, because he works in a studio. Like, if you're not going to work with the public, if you're not putting your life on the line, Shut the fuck up. You can't talk about I'm willing to die for this country if you talk into a goddamn microphone. And this is why I find these right wing radio hosts so insufferable. Like they've never had a real job. These are the real coddled pricks and their parents probably went to Ivy League schools, you know, bought them an education. They never had to work in retail. They never had to have a real fucking job. So it's so easy for them to say, you know, I think old people should die. I'm old. But you're not going to be affected. It's going to be the peasants. And you're an elite. So shut up. But I mean, Glenn Beck isn't the only one because Tom Fitton of Judicial Watch said the same thing. I'm sorry. If it comes down to the economy and uh, killing old people, we're going to opt for killing old people. I appreciate the efforts of the public health officials, uh, but the, you know, Dr. Fauci, for instance, was saying it could be several more weeks before we get the country open again. That can't, that can't, that simply can't be allowed to happen. We've got to get the country moving again. It's the only way to rescue the economy. And frankly, when it comes to the long-term public health of the nation, a strong economy is the best way to protect it. And it doesn't mean you can't take significant steps and continue significant restrictions to secure the public health, whether it be at the border or internally. But we've just got to get people moving back to work, back to school in a regular, organized way while taking into account the public health risks. Because I don't want the cure to kill the patient, which is what I'm concerned about. He doesn't want the cure to kill the patient because that's somehow worse than the disease killing the patient. These people are so stupid so painfully fucking stupid but you know i honestly i shouldn't call them stupid because i think they know what they're doing they're smart smart enough to know what they're doing they're trying to rile up their right-wing base and get them to accept what their party is about to make them do send them to work endanger their own lives and basically die to protect wall street so if you buy into this against your own self-interest very explicitly they're not hiding it I don't know what to say. You're just stupid. If you vote Republican after them explicitly saying we don't care if you die, you're just fucking stupid. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. If a party told me that I was loyal to that they don't care if I live or die, then I would stop supporting that party. Maybe you should do. Maybe you should rethink your vote for Republicans after they're now telling you very explicitly that your lives don't matter. And uh, think about this. Think about how easily they're willing to just throw their base under a bus to protect the profits of private corporations. And they're going to do this, right? Because we're not talking about this. We're not having this conversation in week 13 or week 14 of quarantine. It's week two. Week two, and we're already talking about this. So brace for impact, prepare for disaster because they're going to do the unthinkable. They're going to send people back to work, resume business as usual, and if more than a million people die, estimates say two million, fuck it. There's money to be made. So that's what we're going to do. Now, some of them, some Republicans, are already resuming business as usual. 
For example, Jerry Falwell Jr. is reopening Liberty University this week and ordering all faculty members back to work. How many of them are immunocompromised? How many of them are elderly? I mean, what a pro-life move to make. Like, these people are the biggest frauds ever. They are pro-life only insofar as they're able to weaponize the pro-life issue to help them win elections to then fuck you over economically. Now, I want to share some responses that I thought were just perfect for this. Bree Newsom Bass had the best response, I think. She said, Everyone arguing that 1-2% to of the population dying isn't a big deal needs to identify one or two close family members or friends that they are willing to offer up to death in this moment for capitalism. Name them. Say their names out loud and speak it into the universe with the same ease you condemn others to death. That is exactly it. Candace Owens, if you think that old people should die, are you willing to sacrifice your grandmother or your mother to capitalism? Glenn Beck, are you actually willing to die for capitalism to protect the profits of Wall Street? You're going to go uh, volunteer for a homeless shelter? You're going to go uh, bag groceries? You're going to name anyone in your family who you think is worth uh, killing? To protect the economy? Like, this is what we should force them to do. Because we all know they're not talking about their loved ones. They're talking about our loved ones. The individuals who are disposable, just cogs in the machine, who bag our groceries, you know, who box the things that we buy from Amazon. That's who they're talking about. They're not talking about themselves. They're not talking about elites. They're not talking about oligarchs. They're not talking about the ruling class. They're talking about you and your loved ones, your grandma. Now, I want to share a tweet also from Natalie Shore, who provides us with some much-needed perspective. She writes, If you're rightfully irate that Republicans are now openly asserting that they'll trade lives for points on the Dow, please know that this moment represents a difference of degree but not kind, and that this exact calculus is baked into the very structure of capitalism. Perfectly put. Perfectly put. This is the result of capitalism. We're in late-stage capitalism, where we've stripped away all of the regulations, and now we've unleashed the beast, and, you know, capitalism is like a bull in a china shop. It's just wreaking havoc, and we're just sitting by and watching it destroy everything. And even if it literally starts killing people at a higher rate, to where people know what's the cause of their death... Oh, well, we've already unleashed the beast. You know, there's no putting the cat back in the bag. We've opened Pandora's box. And now we just have to uh, wait until it destroys us and hope that we can somehow restart society after this apocalypse. I mean, the situation is so grim. And, you know, let me just say this to the Democratic Party frauds who are trying to um, capitalize on this. I think it's smart. But, for example, Joe Biden tweeted out that we shouldn't sacrifice people's lives just to make money or help the stock market. But this is an individual who said he would veto Medicare for All as president, which is a policy that saves 68,000 lives per year. This is an estimate that comes from Yale University, not Mike from the Humanist Report, but Yale in a peer-reviewed study. So, I mean, nobody in this system will have your back. He's doing this because he has donors in the healthcare industry. Republicans have donors on Wall Street and that's why they're willing to push everyone out, push them all back to work to make sure that you get the economy running for them so they can continue to live like kings and queens while you die to make sure that, you know, the wheels keep turning. Well, I say to hell with that. You should reject that. It's time for a general strike. If the government isn't going to stop the economy, send people home, then it's on us to shut this motherfucker down, call for a general strike, shut everything down, because if government is going to tell us that we're so useless, we mean so little that we should die to save Wall Street and big business, we have to stand up for ourselves. You have to acknowledge that your life has value, your life has meaning, and no, you shouldn't endanger yourself to protect your employer or your landlord or the Republican Party or Wall Street. Your life has value. And I know that capitalism has kind of brainwashed all of us to get us to think that the most important thing is profits. But your life has value. It's time to deprogram, get out of that cult that is capitalism, and have a general strike and take matters into our own hands. 
Politico put together a really interesting graphic where they actually go through and they map which people, which workers specifically, are the most at risk for contracting COVID-19. Now, as you probably suspected, it is the lowest wage earners in America. So this is a group of about 24 million workers. This includes cashiers, nursing assistants, paramedics, and they usually make less than $35,000 per year. So the people who are the most vulnerable are the least well off, which makes for an absolutely disastrous predicament. Because if you catch COVID-19, there will be medical expenses. There's a story that just came out where one survivor of COVID-19 was billed $35,000 in total. That's an estimate, and I'm paraphrasing the story. But it's, it's a really bad predicament. So what they do here on this graph is they map it out. So as you can see vertically, this is the salary. And horizontally, they have the amount of contact. And people in the 50 to 100 range of contact, they are moderately at risk and the most high at risk. Now, obviously, you know, the one that stands out are registered nurses. You know, physical proximity scale is 94. So they are getting a lot of physical contact. Almost 3 million individuals in this country are registered nurses and they make $70,000 per year. That's better than a lot of people, but certainly nowhere near enough given the risk that this job poses to their health. Now, one that is um, towards the low end, but they're still high at risk, are heavy and tractor trailer truck drivers. They're at 42 on the physical proximity scale. Now, what I found um, not surprising are these areas low wage jobs a retail salesperson they're fairly high on the physical proximity scale at 69 and we have 4.4 million people in this industry and they're getting twenty four thousand dollars per year barely over two grand a month and they are putting their lives at risk cash years 75 on the physical proximity scale 3.6 million people here and they're getting $22,000 per year less than $2,000 per month to put their lives on the line elementary school teachers thankfully schools are shut in some states in my state of Oregon they're shut until the end of April but 79 on the physical proximity scale and they get $59,000 per year uh, personal care aides there are multiple people in my family in this industry Physical proximity scale, 86. So people who aren't making that much money, if they end up contracting COVID-19, then they're going to be worse off. If they're able to survive it, they will be burdened with debt if they don't have insurance. Or maybe they have insurance, but it's not great insurance. It doesn't cover everything. So the fact that we have to worry about this and not just worry about, you know, trying to protect ourselves. You know, we have to worry about the aftermath with regard to bills and healthcare. It makes this type of crisis that much worse. Now let's look at some of these other categories here. So we have nursing assistants, 28,000 per year, 91 on the physical proximity scale. First line supervisors of food preparation, very high proximity. 95 on the physical proximity scale, highly at risk. Hairdressers, hairstylists, cosmetologists, these are people who are in close contact. They're our barbers, you know, cutting our hair. Make 24000 a year, and look at how at risk they are. This is really, it's crazy. Waiters and waitresses, 78 on the physical proximity scale. Cooks. 81 on the physical proximity scale. Social and human service assistants are in contact with the public often. 79 on the physical proximity scale. Bus drivers, school or a special client, 84. Medical assistants, obviously high risk, not much money, $33,000 per year. Like this is, this is insane. Uh, let's see here. Emergency medical technicians and paramedics, 97, very high risk. They make 34000 a year. That's just insane. Dental assistants, uh, 99 on the physical proximity scale, 
and they make 38000 per year. And my uh, niece just became a dental hygienist. She finished school, got a job, ready to start life, got engaged, got laid off just this week. Has to postpone the wedding, worried about now um, not being able to pay rent. Like, I don't know what to tell young people. You know, my generation, millennials, we graduated into the Great Recession, and that was bad. But now, Zoomers are graduating into another recession, possibly a depression and a global pandemic. Like, it keeps getting worse and worse for each successive generation. So let's look at the um, higher income level here. So general and operations managers, you know, they're mid-range here when it comes to physical proximity. So management, probably going to be better off, certainly more so than their workers. Um, we have computer systems analysts. By the way, I will put this link in the description box so you can look at it. I think it's fascinating. Um, the lowest risk are artists. Physical proximity scale, uh, they're at a nine. So artists, you know, people who stay home, um, they're better off. Podcast hosts, you know, people on YouTube, if they do this full time, you know, we're better off. Um, so we have to find other ways to help others, you know, who aren't. Engineering teachers, post-secondary, let's see, administrative uh, services managers, everyone in management and upper management is like up here and they're better off, generally speaking. First line supervisors, mechanics, my dad was a mechanic, always in contact with people. Um, teachers, high risk, um, supervisors, police and detectives, high risk, veterinarians at high risk, physical therapists, high risk. I mean, yeah, that's the highest risk imaginable because you're touching people like you're close, you, you know, you're, you're in their face. Um, veterinarians, uh, you know, even though animals can't contract COVID like dogs, pets you're in these small rooms as they check out your pet but what's interesting is i had to take my dog to the vet and we just waited in our car they came out got him took him in came out with the bill i gave him my card went back in self-quarantine it worked out great so um i'm glad that businesses are you know finding ways to keep social distancing and you know safely conduct business because they shouldn't put their lives at risk we have uh, janitors and maids kind of mid-range there on the uh, on the scale. And they don't make very much money. Like, what you kind of see here is that there's a, a cluster that's in the low-earning area and uh, the highest risk, right? So in the uh, right bottom quadrant, if we imagine, like, this is where you don't want to be. And it looks like the most people are here the highest risk you know food prep workers cashiers so i'm not i'm not you know talking about this to scare you if you are in retail or a cashier a lot of people i know are cashiers because i came from retail and fast food but let me just say that your life and well-being is more important than your job and the economy just know that know your individual self-worth and if you are choosing to go to work because you really feel like you don't have a choice Please take precautions to protect yourself. Try to practice good sanitation habits. Absolutely do not touch your face as you grab uh, or bag people's groceries. Um, if people cough, don't feel ashamed to like step away from them because you have to protect yourself. You are at a high risk job now in a global pandemic. And a lot of people just they disregard these types of low-wage workers. They don't think they should make a living wage. They don't think that they're worth anything. They think this is unskilled labor because anyone can do it. Well, no, not everyone can do it. And a lot of people are unwilling to do it. But a lot of people, they do it because they don't have a choice. And so we have to make it known that their lives are valuable, okay? The people bagging groceries are needed for society to function, right? The retail workers, the fast food employees, like... They are important to our economy. So it's about time we start treating them with the respect that they deserve. Um, so yeah, I'll link to this down below. And um, you can take a look. I've stared at this now for a while. It's, it's fascinating. There's a lot to this graphic. 
but um yeah lowest low uh wage workers at the highest risk and that's um it's not surprising but still very terrifying while joe biden is on tv comparing donald trump to a yo-yo and literally arguing with himself Bernie Sanders is actually proposing real solutions that would help people make it out of this global pandemic. And the reason why Bernie Sanders is able to speak so clearly to the needs of working Americans is because he has already demonstrated that he is knowledgeable of what normal Americans are experiencing. So he knows and can predict the depths of this crisis. He knows how bad it could get if we don't take action and not just any action, very precise action to protect the working class. So in an interview with Chris Hayes on MSNBC, he demonstrated why out of a time when we really need a leader, Bernie Sanders is the leader we've all been looking for. Listen to the way he just eloquently and beautifully explains how we have to make sure we look out for working people. And, you know, this crisis shouldn't have just made us aware of, you know, the needs of working class people. You know, the fact that it got to this point to where people are living paycheck to paycheck and are now missing paychecks, it's not just a crisis that's created by the global pandemic. This is a crisis that we kind of brought on by ourselves with our absolutely ruthless and brutal economic system known as capitalism. Take a look. We face at this moment, in terms of the pandemic, uh, in terms of the economic meltdown, the most serious set of crises that have been faced in this country perhaps for 100 years. And our job right now is to think big, is to act in an unprecedented way, both in terms of health care and in terms of the economy. And it is going to cost a lot of money, but not spending that money now will make a bad situation even worse. Because as you know, there are some people out there talking about, by the end of June, unemployment being 20, 25, 30 percent. So right now, our focus has got to be, in my view, to make sure that all workers in this country are kept whole, they continue to get their paycheck, to make certain that in addition to that, people get a check of $2,000 uh, a month, uh, to make certain right now that we move in an unbelievably aggressive way to make sure that our health care providers, our doctors and our nurses are not dying on the job trying to protect us. And that means that Trump has got to enforce in a vigorous way uh, the Defense Production Act to make sure that companies now are not producing T-shirts and underwear. That is not our major need at the moment. Masks, gowns, gloves are the need. And companies have got to do that. Some are already voluntarily doing it. They need to be compensated well. But they got to transform uh, their production capabilities to deal with the crises uh, that we face right now. Uh, the other thing I think, Chris, you know, is that while Congress and there are going to be people up all night right now working on this $2 trillion bill, uh, people are working really hard. They understand the extent of the tragedy. We also have to take a deep breath and ask how we got to be in a country where so many people uh, are in financial despair right now. What I worry about is that at a time when half of our people live in paycheck to paycheck, those paychecks are stopping. There are people out there watching yeah. this program who are saying, I can't feed my kids tomorrow. How did we get there? How do we have a health care system which was so unprepared, among many other things, for this epidemic? So contrast that interview that you just saw with any interview that Joe Biden has done in the last week. He did three or four today. What you hear from Bernie Sanders is clarity and leadership. He is very quick to speak precisely to the needs of of the American people. He says Donald Trump needs to utilize the Defense Production Act. We're hearing a lot about this, but he goes further. He explains exactly what it can do and why it's necessary. You know, we don't need com companies producing t-shirts and underwear, as he put it. We need them making equipment that can assist healthcare workers. Because guess what? If we don't have the necessary equipment to protect people with COVID-19, to protect the healthcare workers who are making sure that those people stay alive, then this crisis is going to get a lot worse really fast. And speaking to the financial need of people, what we need is obvious. $2,000 per month to people throughout the duration of this crisis, I think it should be permanent 
after that, 1,000 at least. But that's something that will help. On top of that, we have to make sure that we suspend rent. We suspend mortgages. We don't allow people to go further into debt, suspend student loan payments, freeze all of that. Like if we're not talking about cancellation at a bare minimum, everyone in government should be talking about freezes. But the fact that only Bernie Sanders and a handful of lawmakers are talking about this, it's kind of insane. It shows you how out of touch they are. But Bernie Sanders said something here that really should scare every single out of touch elite. This isn't surprising to you or me, but the out-of-touch elites in D.C., the pundits, the politicians, they really need to heed his warning. He said, at a time when half our people are living paycheck to paycheck, those paychecks are stopping. I don't think people really get that. I don't think they grasp the gravity of the situation. People in government, that is. They don't get it. Like, you can, you know, fuck people over. You can leave them out to dry for decades, but at the end of the day, so long as there's no more distractions, there's no more need for them to continue, you know, being a cog in the machine because they're losing everything. That's when shit gets real, for lack of a better word. That's when social order starts, you know, going into chaos, right? People, they behave, they go to work, they come home and they distract themselves with video games and Netflix. But when you take away their livelihoods and they feel as if they have nothing left to lose, that's when people really start taking to the streets. That's when we see a general strike. So lawmakers who aren't taking this seriously, they do it at their own peril. Because if workers have nothing left and you're not willing to stop them from losing what little they have... Do you honestly think that capitalism is going to be able to survive? No, the system will implode in on itself. And this is what anti-capitalists like myself have been warning people about. Capitalism, if you don't at least try to rein it in, it's difficult. But if you don't try, it eventually becomes so big to where it enters late stage capitalism and now end stage capitalism. And it starts to literally eat itself where it takes away everything from workers because that need to, you know, increase profits is so strong that, oh, wait, we've taken all the money from the peasants and now they have nothing and they can't buy the products and the services that we're producing. What do we do? And it's reaching that point. COVID-19, this global pandemic could accelerate that process. And with the way that, you know, government is dragging its feet, we had a lot of talk about universal basic income temporarily but Democrats were talking about means testing it, and now Republicans don't really want to do anything for workers. At least what they're proposing isn't sufficient, but, you know, if Democrats go along with this, then they're also bailing out large industries, private companies, you know, corporate welfare, and there's no stipulations, no uh, assurances at all that that money isn't just going to go into stock buybacks, and, you know, we need it to help workers. So the situation is grim, and lawmakers, I don't think that they fully grasp what's about to happen, how society will devolve into chaos if they don't actually take this seriously, both from a healthcare standpoint and economically. But Bernie Sanders gets it. And look, there's still a chance. He can still be the president. He can still be the nominee. So half the country in the Democratic primary, they still haven't voted yet. I haven't voted. New Yorkers haven't voted yet. It's not too late. We could have a real leader. We could have a real leader. And it's tough. Bernie's going to struggle to get headlines during a global pandemic. It's difficult to, you know, organize when you can't knock on doors. But there's still a chance for us to turn this entire thing around, save the country and save the planet if Bernie's president. But anything short of that, I just don't think we have a chance. And even if he does become president, that doesn't mean that our path forward is easier. It's going to get tougher regardless. Our trajectory that we're on, you know, it, our prospects are relatively grim. So we just need someone who's willing to fight. That's it. And we can still we can still have that with Bernie Sanders. So whatever you do, convince convince people and your family um, digitally, don't see them in person because they're social distancing, convince them that they have to vote for Bernie Sanders if they actually want 
to change the country for the better because he cares. He cares about the people and this is self-sacrifice. He's not running for self-serving reasons. I mean, if he were wanting to be president, he probably would have ran when he were when he was younger. But I mean, he's running because he cares. Help him help you. Vote for Bernie Sanders if you haven't already. We still have a chance. So there was a little bit of rumbling last week and at the beginning of this week that Bernie Sanders was considering the possibility of dropping out. But thankfully, it appears that that's not going to be the case because the New York Times released an article where according to his campaign, his closest confidants, he's going to stay in the race, he's going to compete, and if there is in fact another debate in April, he's going to show up and he's going to fight for the nomination. And I think that that really is important because this is an unprecedented time. Before this crisis happened, the nomination was an entirely different race. And now that it happened and we're kind of all experiencing this together, we need to hear different ideas. We need to hear different approaches. So I think it is important that Bernie Sanders stays in, allow the rest of the country to make their voices heard. And, you know, there's some logistics to figure out. How do we institute vote by mail in time for these primaries? Will they be postponed? There's a lot to figure out. But Bernie should stay in. And if you haven't seen it, check out my video. I will provide you with some reasons in that video as to why I think he should stay in. But um, Joe Biden was asked whether or not he'd be willing to debate Bernie Sanders. And quite frankly, he says no. Secondly, Bernie Sanders uh, campaign has said that he would debate if there was a debate in April. Do you think there should be another debate in April? And would you participate? My focus is just dealing with this crisis right now. I haven't thought about any more debates. I think we've had enough debates. I think we should get on with this. But uh, um... so he's focusing on coronavirus. What exactly are you doing? Because you went MIA for almost a week after winning three states on March 17th. And now you're too busy to participate in a two hour debate, three maximum, but most likely two hour debate. Like, what are you doing? You're not doing shit, Joe Biden. You're not doing shit. And he knows damn well that in the events he debates Bernie Sanders, that is, you know, going to be another possibility for him to face plant, potentially look like a fool and lose momentum. Now, if you look at public opinion polls, there hasn't been much lately, but national polling suggests that Joe Biden is starting to lose momentum. Bernie is starting to gain momentum. Now, the problem is that the rate to which Bernie's gaining momentum it's very slow. So Biden knows, you know, he doesn't have this wrapped up yet. Bernie Sanders isn't mathematically eliminated. So if he debates Bernie Sanders and it goes horribly wrong, it goes any way that, you know, his last interviews went, it could be bad for him. It could be enough to change the dynamic of the race. Now, I don't necessarily believe that any debate with Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders could be as catastrophic for Joe Biden as that Mike Bloomberg debate was because like, that was a different time in America, even though that was like a month away. Now, everyone is glued to their televisions looking for information on COVID-19. Mainstream media isn't going to talk about the Democratic Party primary. They're going to pretend as if it's over. So it's going to be harder to get everyone's attention. But still, you know, even if nothing changes, when we see this debate and Biden has another solid performance, you still have to do it because this primary isn't over and since the last debate and last couple of debates, things in this country and the world have changed dramatically. So, of course, you have to, you know, show people that you're still, you know, you're in tune to what they're dealing with. And if anything, Joe Biden needs more practice before going up against Donald Trump in September if he is the nominee. So, I mean, this is just going to help you. But, I mean, we all know Joe Biden is scared. His team wants to hide him away. And I'll admit, I think that's a good strategy. If I were working for Joe Biden, I never would. But if I were, I would hide him away as much as possible from the public. Because the more he's out, the more visible he is, of course, you know, the more chance that people will see him face plan or make a gaffe or say something stupid. Um, but, I mean, he wanted to be president, so... This is uh, what you have to do. Now, Bernie was asked about this in an interview with CNN. Anderson Cooper asked him what he thought about Joe Biden's, you know, disregard of the possibility of a debate. And Bernie Sanders, I think, made a really strong case for another debate. Vice President Biden was asked about whether there should be another debate in, in April. He essentially said, you know, uh, the, the time is done for, for that. Um, 
I'm wondering what you made of his response. Well, I, I, you know, I, I don't agree with him. I mean, I think that what is happening right now, obviously, it's a very strange moment for any campaign. And that is state after state. I think Pennsylvania yesterday or today is delaying their elections. Kentucky has delayed their elections. New York State considering delaying their uh, elections. So we've got a strange moment. But I think, you know, one of the things that I, I think the people want is especially in this unprecedented crisis in modern American history, is to hear the ideas of candidates as to how we got into this disaster. Why do we have such a dysfunctional health care system? Why do we have an economy in which half of our people are living paycheck to paycheck, scared to death tonight that if their paycheck ceases, uh, how they're going to feed their kids and, take, and pay the rent? So I think we need a good debate as to where we go, not only just now, but in the future. And to my mind, if there's anything that this unprecedented moment in American history should teach us, we got to rethink the basic structures of American society. And that is guarantee health care to all as a human right, create an economy that provides for all people, not just the wealthy. Yeah, I agree with Bernie Sanders. Things have changed substantially just within the span of a couple of weeks. Our lives are incredibly different now. So you have to give people the option to maybe go in a different direction. And, you know, it's not like it's a foregone conclusion that a debate is going to fundamentally reshape the dynamics of this race. A lot of people have just moved on. The media certainly has moved on. But you have to have this debate. You have two competitors. One of them is the front runner, but the other is not mathematically eliminated. So just you agreed to 12 debates. Joe Biden agreed to 12 debates. So to not at least meet the bare minimum and just suck it up for two hours and have another debate. I mean, come on. For Bernie Sanders, though, he has everything to gain, nothing to lose. Joe Biden has everything to lose and nothing to gain. But it's probably not even that serious. So the fact that he doesn't want to debate Bernie Sanders, it shows what a coward he is. Look, if you can't debate Bernie Sanders, someone who's willing to be really nice to you, then you can't take on Donald Trump. And I think that he realizes that people are losing confidence in him. His six-day MIA, right? His media tours, his gaffes, the fact that he hasn't been a leader during this COVID-19 crisis. People are losing confidence in him. And so there's a lot of pressure in these debates. If he doesn't perform well, Democrats may lose even more faith in him. So he knows that there's a lot at stake. But regardless, you agree to 12, at least do 12. That's the bare minimum. Um, it's the right thing to do. It's the de democratic thing to do. And people deserve to see another debate. We've had one one-on-one -on -one debate with Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden. Let's at least have one more before you try to wrap this thing up and Democratic Party elites try to wrap this thing up. So currently, Joe Biden is vetting several women to possibly be VP. And, you know, there is different criteria that I'm assuming he's using. But one specific thing he's really looking for is someone who is prepared to lead the country should he not be able to be president. Now, this is according to a report by Mariana Sotomayor and Tim Stello of NBC News. And some people on the left are kind of thinking, does this mean, like, is he kind of signaling that he doesn't think he'll be able to serve a full term? I don't necessarily think that that's the case. I think that he may just be choosing someone who he thinks can take over in the event he chooses not to pursue a second term if he's elected president. But nonetheless, let's hear him out. So Democratic presidential frontrunner Joe Biden said Sunday that he has talked with former President Barack Obama about a potential vice presidential pick. Speaking to over 70 Georgia donors on a fundraising call, Biden said he and Obama recently agreed that his vice presidential nominee must have the political experience to step in as president if he were unable to serve. The most important thing, and I've actually talked to Brock about this, the most important thing is that there has to be someone who the day after they're picked is prepared to be president of the United States of America if something happened, Biden said. 
They have to be prepared, Biden said. Once I pick someone, God willing, if I'm the nominee, that there's not going to be any snafu. Biden has said repeatedly that he would prefer to pick a woman as his vice president, but he disclosed only recently that he is taking his age, he is 77, into consideration as he makes his choice. I have to pick someone, if God forbid tomorrow, if I contracted what my son had or something like that, that the person is ready on day one to be president of the United States, Biden said in February at a CNN town hall in Manchester, New Hampshire. So look, I will admit that I think that people are probably reading a little bit too much into this. Anytime you are trying to figure out who should be your vice presidential pick, you do have to take that into consideration. If something catastrophic happens and you die, that person has to be ready to assume the role as president. And, you know, as we saw back in 2008, especially if you're older, you can really make a choice that just ruins your chances. Like, John McCain chose Sarah Palin, and now the Republican Party is perfectly, you know, uh, comfortable with that type of politician since we have Donald Trump. A lot of people view that as, you know, hurting his chances. If he died, you know, while he was in office, Sarah Palin would become president, and she is an imbecile, right? So I think that Joe Biden knows he has to pick someone that's competent. But with that being said, given the state of his cognitive functions, you know, is there a possibility that he's choosing someone to lead should he not be able to even complete a term? I mean, sure, it's it's entirely possible, but what I kind of think when I see this is, one, sure, you have to be responsible and pick someone who's ready, but two, I don't think he wants to run for a second term if he's elected president. I don't even think he really wants to be president. I think that he thought this would be easy. You know, he wouldn't have to fight hard for it. He just runs and is president. He's always wanted to be president, so why not? I don't think he actually wants to do this. I don't think he's up to the task. So if he's elected, he is choosing someone who he thinks will be his successor in the same way that he was Obama's successor. He's choosing someone to basically carry on his legacy, whatever that may be. Um, and that's kind of what I am looking at, which is why I think that Having Joe Biden be the Democratic Party nominee is really harmful to the progressive movement because if he is the president, sure, that's preferable to Donald Trump getting another four years given how close, you know, he is to replacing another seat on the uh, Supreme Court. Then whoever Joe Biden's nominee is does have a really good chance of becoming the next nominee because name recognition is incredibly important. So let's say he picks some corporate tool like Stacey Abrams. Well, automatically, she is well positioned to run in 2024, 2028. And that sucks because she has a good shot of winning in that instance if she was a former vice president. And she's a terrible candidate. She's not a good candidate. She's a corporate sellout. She's friends with Mike Bloomberg, of all people. So, you know, who he picks is going to influence the Democratic Party and their trajectory for the coming years, if not decades. So that is what, you know, I think he's looking at. You know, who is going to carry on this pro-corporate legacy, you know, because we, we've heard there are various reports that Bill Clinton told Tom Perez to not let Bernie Sanders take over the Democratic Party. We know that the elites, the leaders in the Democratic Party, Barack Obama stepped in to make sure that Keith Ellison couldn't be the DNC chair, so that way Tom Perez would win. He made calls on his behalf. So the party doesn't want to relinquish control to the progressive wing of the party. They don't want to do that. So I think that this is also what Biden is considering. But sure, I do think there's a possibility that, you know, maybe he is worried about his own health. Maybe he is worried that, you know, cognitively he may not be able to handle being president. Um, but I think that mostly what this is about is someone who he believes can carry on his legacy once he chooses to step down and not seek a second term. Because I really can't imagine a situation to where he's elected president and he is looking for a second term. I mean, with Bernie, if he were president, sure, you can expect him to seek a second term because, you know, he's currently sharp. You know, he he's quick on his toes. He's doing OK. But with Joe Biden, I mean, we all see that it's obvious he clearly should not be doing this. It almost feels really cruel to have him run for president and to have his staffers, you know, push him so hard because it's like he should be spending time with his grandchildren and retiring. So, 
you know, I don't know what this means. Certainly, you know, all we can do is speculate. But Joe Biden kind of put his foot in his mouth by using sp specific words like, you know, if there's any snafu, I mean, that's not really doing anything to assure people that, you know, you're you're confident in your own ability and more importantly, healthy because, you know, age is not the most important thing ever. But, you know, you you have to give us confidence. And with statements like this, he's not really giving people confidence. So to people reading, you know, I think a little bit too much into it, I don't necessarily blame them because this does seem like he's not really confident that he's going to be able to serve, you know, a full term, even if I don't necessarily think that that's what he's implying. But I mean, he just he can't not say a thing that makes us feel uneasy about him being the nominee. So, I mean, look, it's not too late. You can still vote for Bernie Sanders, someone who clearly will be capable of serving at least four years. So um, vote for Bernie because Joe Biden would be a disaster. And, you know, even if he's just in there for four years, whoever his VP will be will probably be terrible and continue this corporate neoliberal legacy uh, that, of the Democratic Party and the one that the trajectory that they're on currently. And that is something that we just can't afford to do any longer. So, as many of you know, several women came forward last year with allegations against Joe Biden. And these allegations uh, claim that he touched them inappropriately. Now, the things that these women, individuals like Lucy Flores, alleged were that he, you know, without their consent, smelled their hair, kissed their heads, you know, things of that nature. Um, and he apologized, and then the media, after defending him, moved on. However... Now, we are learning about an allegation from a woman named Tara Reid that is very serious. This is the most serious allegation that has been alleged about Joe Biden, and she reportedly tried to come forward at the time when other women were coming forward, although she was discouraged after being attacked and defamed, and she reached out to an organization called Time's Up, which is supposed to help Me Too victims, and she was denied because uh, they claim that since they are a nonprofit, they can't help her against someone who's running for federal office, which is really a dubious claim to make, legally speaking. But the story goes a little bit deeper, and Ryan Grimm released an article in The Intercept that explains that there's a conflict of interest that prevented them from helping her out. But before we get to that, I actually want to go over her claims, because these haven't been independently uh, vetted yet. Ryan Grimm didn't really talk about these claims in his article. He talks more so about the aspects of Time's Up not wanting to assist her, but she did appear on Katie Halper's podcast, and she described what Joe Biden allegedly did to her, and this is very serious. Now, I can't provide you with the evidence. I can't independently verify the claims that she's making myself. So all we have right now are her story her words her story and we have not heard at the time i'm recording this from joe biden or his team yet but i do think that she deserves to be heard and i think that this is uh important it goes beyond politics this is about making sure that people in power men in power specifically can't use their positions of power to get their subordinates to do things that are inappropriate that they don't feel comfortable doing so I'm going to play a little clip. This is about two minutes long from her interview with Katie Halper. You can find this full video here on Katie's Twitter, but she hasn't released the full interview as of yet. When that does come out, I'll link to it down below. But here's a quick overview of what she claims Biden did to her back in the 90s when she worked for him. He just said, hey, come here, Tara. And then I, I handed him the thing and he greeted me. He remembered my name. and then. It, we were alone and it was the strangest thing. There was no like exchange really. He just had me up against the wall and um, I was wearing like a skirt and, you know, business skirt, but I wasn't wearing stockings. It was kind of a hot day that day and I was wearing heels. And I remember my legs had been hurting from the marble, you know, of the Capitol, mm -hmm. like walking. And I, so I remember that kind of stuff. I remember like, I was wearing a blouse and he just had me up against the wall and the wall was cold. And I remember he, it happened all at once. The gym bag 
I don't know where it went. I handed it to him. It was gone. And then his hands were on me and underneath my clothes. And um, yeah, and then he went, oh, he went down my skirt, but then up inside it. And he uh, penetrated me with his fingers, whatever. And um, I, uh, he was kissing me at the same time and he was saying something to me. He said several things and I can't remember everything he said. I remember a couple of things. I remember him saying first, before, like as he was doing it, do you want to go somewhere else? And then him saying to me when I pulled away, he um, got finished doing what he was doing and I kind of was pulled back and he said, he said, come on, man, I heard you liked me. Mm. And it's that phrase stayed with me because I kept thinking what I might've said. And I can't remember exactly if he said I thought or if I heard, but it's, it's like he implied like that I had done this, like, I don't know. And for me, it was like every, everything shattered in that moment because I knew like we were alone. It was over, right? He wasn't trying to do anything more, but it's, I looked up to him. He was like my father's age. He was this champion of women's rights in my eyes and I couldn't believe it was happening. It didn't see, it seems surreal. So as you heard from the details of this, these are very serious allegations. You know, the inappropriate touching was one thing, but what she is describing here is full on sexual assault. So what I think needs to happen is the FBI needs to investigate this. If Joe Biden you know, wanted to be responsible. He would call for an FBI investigation. But um, yeah, this is uh, this is very disturbing. Now, she went on to talk about how he pointed at her. He put his finger in her face or something like that and said, you're nothing to me because he was offended that she rejected his advance. It's it's really, really troubling. Now, I do want to get to uh, Ryan Grimm's piece here. This isn't the full story, but I'll link to that also down below. What he describes here is also really disturbing because it shows that, you know, conflicts of interests exist in politics. And even though organizations do good, at the end of the day, you know, politics is politics and people in power are going to have a lot of their little uh, minions look out for them. So Ryan Grimm writes, Last April, Tara Reid watched as a familiar conversation around her former boss, Joe Biden, and his relationship with personal space unfolded on the national stage. Nevada politician Lucy Flores alleged that Biden had inappropriately sniffed her hair and kissed the back of her head as she waited to go on stage at a rally in 2014. Biden, in a statement in response, said that not once in his career did he believe that he had acted inappropriately. But Flores's allegation sounded accurate to Reid. She said because Reid had experienced something very similar as a staffer in Biden's Senate office years earlier. After she saw an episode of the ABC show The View in which most of the panelists stood up for Biden and attacked Flores as politically motivated, Reid decided that she had no choice but to come forward and support Flores. She gave an interview to a local reporter describing several instances in which Biden had behaved similarly toward her, inappropriately touching her during her early 90s tenure in his Senate office. In that first interview, she decided to tell a piece of the story she said that matched what had happened to Flores, plus she had filed a contemporary complaint and there were witnesses so she considered the allegation bulletproof. The short article brought a wave of attention on her along with accusations that she was doing the bidding of Russian President Vladimir Putin. So Reid went quiet. As the campaign went on, Reid, who first supported Senator Elizabeth Warren and then Senator Bernie Sanders, began to reconsider staying silent. She thought about the world she wanted her daughter to live in and decided that she wanted to continue telling her story and push back against what she saw as online defamation. To get legal help and manage what she knew from her first go-round would be serious backlash, she reached out to the organization Time's Up, established in the wake of the Me Too movement, to help survivors tell their stories. By February, she learned from a new conversation with Time's Up, which also involved director Sharon Tijani, that no assistance could be provided because the person she was accusing, Biden, was a candidate for federal office and assisting a case against him could jeopardize the organization's nonprofit status. The public relations firm that works on behalf of the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund is SKD Knickerbocker, whose managing director, Anita Dunn, is the top advisor to Biden's presidential campaign. A spokesperson for Biden declined to comment. 
Department. The SKDK spokesperson assigned to Time's Up referred questions back to the National Women's Law Center. So, you know, it, it's it's absurd to think that they would lose their nonprofit status because, first of all, the whole point of the Me Too movement is to communicate to people in positions of power that they are not protected from these types of allegations. Harvey Weinstein, you know, politicians. So if you're saying that your goal is to protect women, but you can't touch anyone who's a politician who's running for office, what's the point? Now, of course, this is nonsensical. Lawyers who Ryan Grimm consulted with said, no, that what they're saying is a stretch. It doesn't really make sense. What I think makes sense is that Anita Dunn, she is working with Biden's campaign and um, they didn't want to pursue this because they knew that it could potentially hurt him politically. And Tara, as far as I know, is a credible person. Her allegation is very serious. And I understand her reasoning as to why she didn't want to come out. First of all, she initially supported Elizabeth Warren and then moved on to Bernie Sanders. So by supporting Biden's opponents, his biggest opponents, she didn't want this to seem politically motivated. On top of this, she didn't want to single-handedly hurt Joe Biden's chances because she doesn't want Donald Trump to get reelected. And on top of that, Democrats attacked her by calling her a Russian asset. How despicable is that? They're not being responsible and calling for an investigation. They're not calling for these claims to be vetted. They smeared and defamed her. That's what they chose to do. This is just despicable. Now, after we just saw Christine Blasey Ford come out against Brett Kavanaugh, everyone who was in the Democratic Party said that, you know, Brett Kavanaugh, if he were truly innocent, would call for an investigation, would actually vet these claims. And they were critical of Republicans, rightfully so. But now, all of a sudden, crickets, silence. The media is ignoring this story so far. Me Too activists like Alyssa Milano defended Joe Biden last year and are saying nothing now, at the time I record this video, about Tara Reid's claims. These are very serious claims. This is exactly what the Me Too movement was created for, to let women know that they can actually share their story, right? If they had someone who was in a powerful position come on to them, touch them inappropriately, sexually assault them, they could share their story, and this movement had their backs. But what Democrats are doing is choosing to put politics over morality. And that's genuinely disgusting. Like, this story, beyond, like, the actual details, makes me lose a lot of faith in humanity, because I already knew that Democrats didn't actually care about the causes that they, you know, try to promote, women's rights, marginalized communities. I know that they use these types of communities as props to help themselves get elected. It seemed, you know, legitimate to the left, but just how brazen they are at just not caring at all about a very serious allegation because they don't want to hurt Joe Biden's chances. I mean, who cares about politics in this instance? Who cares about politics? And, you know, I know that as a Bernie Sanders supporter, that sounds, you know, rich coming from me of all people. But in the event, a politician that I supported was um, accused of something like this, I would expect from them what I expect from anyone else. Call on the FBI to investigate and vet these claims. You would want it to be looked into further if you truly are innocent. Now, we don't know about these details. We don't necessarily know at this point in time what Joe Biden's team is saying. So far, they haven't responded to Ryan Grimm's article. And they're kind of just trying to sleep on this story in hopes that it will die and that, you know, everyone will ignore it since we're all focused on COVID-19. But I think that Tara has a right to be heard. As far as we know, she seems perfectly credible. She tried to come out at a time when other women who felt, you know, that they were um, violated by Joe Biden if he touched them, kissed them, um, were coming out, and that's reasonable, but she didn't want to deal with the backlash. If you are a normal citizen and you suddenly get a wave of attention and it's disproportionately negative, that's really, really scary. That's really scary. Like, I know firsthand, not because of this, but like when I first 
was doing YouTube videos, and one of the first videos I posted um, went semi-viral because it appeared on the front page of Reddit. I actually put that video on private so people couldn't see it because the comments that were said about me really, like, they uh, kind of crushed my soul. So, you know, getting attention just in general is really scary. But if you're getting that kind of attention, if people are calling you a Russian asset, that's really scary, especially if you're coming out and you're saying something that is really serious like this. So I totally understand her reasoning. I think it's it's sound. Like, I, would, I wouldn't know what to do. And this is why a lot of women don't share their stories because it's incredibly scary and they have no confidence that anything will be done. But I mean, the Me Too movement, the Time's Up Fund was created specifically for this purpose. So women live in an environment where they feel comfortable sharing their stories. And now that it's someone that, you know, they like, they're like, nope, sorry, we're going to leave you hanging. We'll refer you to the Women's Law Center, but we're not going to help you. So um, we, again, have to acknowledge that these are allegations at this point. They have not been confirmed these uh, claims have not, as far as I know, been vetted, but we need the authorities to get involved. We need the FBI to investigate this. She has witnesses, people she talked to at the time uh, and shared her story with, you know, her brother, friends. She shared the story with her mother, who has since passed away. Ryan Grimm talks about this in an interview with Crystal Ball on The Hill, but this is incredibly serious and, you know, people need to know about this putting aside the political ramifications, we have to be consistent because we can't just pick and choose when to take these claims seriously if it's politically expedient. We have to be consistent and vet all of these claims and make sure that we hear these types of stories out, right? And let the people decide if they choose to believe it or not. But this is serious and action needs to be taken. Attention needs to be paid to this story. So you have the details. Um... You'll just have to decide, but we'll wait to see if the media actually covers this and actually does a more comprehensive investigation. All right, folks, that is everything. As usual, before we leave, I want to thank all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members for helping the show not just to survive, but thrive as well. Uh, I know that you all are getting a little bit of uh, antsiness. You're feeling cabin fever because this is now week two of you being in quarantine. Just know that this is all temporary. This will end. I don't know how normal things will be, but there will be a new normal. This will probably change the world forever, but just know that this is all temporary. And even though the future is uncertain, I don't want you all to, you know, to be depressed and, you know, feel down because you can't leave your house or your apartment or your studio, whatever. So just reach out. You know, there are other people who are experiencing your, you know, what you're experiencing as well. You, you know, these unique uh, instances where, you know, you have no food or maybe you have no friends, nobody to talk to, you're feeling depressed, reach out. There are people who are experiencing the same exact thing that you're experiencing. So I just want you to know that you're not alone during this time of quarantine and we're all going to, you know, deal with this and get through it together. So that's all I've got for you all. I'll see you next week. Take care, everyone.